So I used to work on the north slope of Alaska. It was March on the slope, and while still in the depths of Arctic winter, with the equinox approaching, the day and night cycle was becoming more even. My flight to the slope was delayed due to a large blizzard, which shut down everything. I spent three days waiting in Anchorage until the storm cleared and we were able to fly again. Landing at the airstrip, it was evident quickly that the blizzard was more severe than we had initially thought. While whiteout blizzards are pretty common, actual snow accumulation isn't. This storm, though, was a monster. Snowdrifts several stories tall ran up against the camp housing. Our work trucks and equipment were completely covered in snow, and it took a full day of digging to get them out. As soon as the trucks were free, we were off to our first job assignment. No time to rest in the oil field. Traveling anywhere after a storm this size is an absolute nightmare. To get to the work site, we had a bulldozer have to escort us, breaking up any remaining drifts as we went. The dozer cleared our work area around the well house and we began to rig up our equipment. It took a little bit of time, but soon we were back to the normal humdrum life of Arctic oil well maintenance. Now, over the radio, we got a call from the bulldozer operator as he left that he had seen a giant black animal headed our direction. He couldn't tell if it was a wolf or a big dog, but it was massive apparently and moving erratically. In the winter, many animals are not active on the slope. Caribou, musk oxen, and foxes are the usual wildlife you'll encounter out here in the snow. The animals keep to themselves for the most part, though. You learn very quickly to never look the animals in the eyes if they approach you. This goes doubly for the foxes, and I advise you to do the same. The grizzlies are hibernating, though. The male polar bears are hunting on the sea ice, while the females are denned up with the cubs. Wolves aren't unheard of, but rarely leave the Brooks Range Mountains a couple of hundred miles to the south. Whatever the operator saw, we would keep watch, but it wasn't really our problem. It was really a problem for the bear police, so we went about our work, albeit cautiously. It's interesting to note that oil companies on the slope have private security officers, who, besides being private law enforcement, also try to minimize encounters with wildlife. We refer to them as the Bear Police, which is a cute name for a rather dangerous part of their job. These security officers are really the only personnel on the North Slope, outside of regular law enforcement, that can carry firearms. Their primary job when encountering large predators is to harass them until they leave. This is done with beanbag guns or loud noises at first, and when that fails or the animal is unusually aggressive, lethal force is needed. So, we had settled into our work and forgot about the wolf or the dog or whatever it was. I needed to take a leak, so I got out of the truck and walked behind the well house to take care of business. My crewmate came over the radio telling me to get back in the truck though, because there was a wolf coming out from behind the well house where I had just been, and he was pacing after me. I didn't look behind me, I just ran back and jumped into the truck. I mean, I'm not taking any chances, even if it was a crewmate's practical joke. But once inside, I looked out, and sure enough, trotting towards the truck was a large black male wolf. He approached our trucks and sort of plopped down on the snow in front of us. This wolf looked rough, man, even by wild animal standards. The right side of his face was mutilated and completely deformed. He was missing his right eye and most of his skin and lips on the side of his head was gone. The wound exposed a large white teeth, giving him the appearance of a, a wide crooked smile. He didn't appear aggressive, but he didn't take his good eye off of us either. That one good eye was bright red in appearance as well, and it was eerie to say the least. The way he sat there, staring, watching, just waiting. We radioed the security officers for help and like a speeding bullet they showed up 40 minutes later. That whole time waiting, the wolf never diverted his attention from us. Quite honestly, if I hadn't have seen him breathing for myself, then 
I would have assumed that it was a statue. That's how still it was. The security officers arrived though and they took some pictures for their reports. Then they began the process of driving the animal back out into the tundra. Truck horns didn't startle it, didn't even flinch. Charging him with their truck? That did nothing either. They then took aim with a beanbag gun and hit him square in the ribs. The wolf let out a yelp but didn't get up or move from his spot. The next beanbag hit him in the head and that seemed to jostle him enough to get up and leave. Security told us to call back if we saw the wolf again. They seemed confident that he would move on and not be a bother anymore. The sun was setting and our job was still hours from wrapping up. Working a, a 13 to 15 hour day isn't unusual here. You either get used to it, to the long hours, or you find another line of work pretty quick, let me tell you. I was running the computer equipment inside the truck and weird data was coming back from the tools down in the well. They were blanking out and losing signal or they were reporting data backwards, but diagnostics wasn't indicating any issues. To the computer systems, everything was operating normally. I tried a few different things to fix the issue, but it persisted. One of the workers went out to the wellhead to check the gauges and cables and whatnot, trying to isolate the problem from there. He was outside for not more than five minutes before the night was pierced by a long bellowing howl. This was immediately followed by the high-pitched shriek of our crewmate. Throwing the door open, I was able to catch a fleeting glimpse of a dark, huge figure running behind the wellhouse. Our crewmate ran past us and jumped inside. Pale, sweating, and full of adrenaline, he tried to relate to us what had just happened. Through his panting, he said that he was in the wellhouse checking the cables when someone walked up behind him. Thinking that it was one of us, he started a conversation with his back turned. When he got no reply, he turned and was met face to face with a seven foot tall black wolf standing on his hind legs. It stood behind him in the door, growling. Without thinking, he flung his pipe wrench at the beast, struck him hard in the chest, and that's when it let out a howl and ran off. Our crewmate was adamant that this was the same wolf from earlier because its face was mangled in that sort of crooked half smile and one fiery red eye look. Myself and the others on the crew, we had a hard time believing that he saw a giant wolf man like that. We had no doubt that he saw the wolf, but we reasoned that in his panic he saw something that wasn't really there, that it was upright like a man like that. But I have to admit that we'd all encountered enough weird things on the slope to never count out the impossible here. We radioed the security officers though and told them that the wolf had returned and waited inside the truck. I mean, what else could we do but wait too? I wasn't about to go out there and fight Satan's guard dog with a clipboard and a mouse pad. Weirdly too, every time we felt like things settled down outside, we would hear a growl or something would push against the truck or something. But periodically, we could see something pacing in the dark just beyond the reach of our work lights. Even though we were inside a locked truck cabin, it was still a very vulnerable feeling. We were very much trapped and I'm sure it felt similar to what divers experience inside of a shark cage far out at sea. All of this though went on for an hour while we waited for someone to show up. Finally, coming up the road, we could see headlights of three approaching vehicles. The security team had finally showed up, this time with actual rifles. Over the radio, we told them what had been going on, and you could feel their disbelief and eyes rolling through the radio as they spoke to us. But that sass and disbelief soon faded when we explored the worksite and found it covered in fresh, large wolf tracks. The security team, they split up with two trucks headed out to search for this wolf, while the last one remained with us, and we loaded our equipment and finished our job. We didn't hear or see anything else that night as we cleaned up, but we sure did keep our heads on a swivel. The security officers didn't find the wolf that night. 
A set of tracks left off the worksite and out into the open tundra. The officers commented that the tracks looked a bit weird. This was due to them only seeing the, the back paw prints in the snow apparently. That last security truck escorted us back to the main camp while the others continued their search into the night. For the following week, various reports came in across the oil field of people seeing this mangled black wolf during the day. And at night, reports kept coming back in of a black beast walking upright and harassing or cornering workers. Security seemed to always show up minutes too late too. During this time frame, many of the Alaska native workers were getting really nervous. One of our friends in the camp workshop was a native from a small Inuit village just west of the oil field. And he told us that it sounded exactly like an Ijarak. A shape-shifting creature that can take the form of an arctic animal while it hunts. He said that it was obvious as the wolf was a normal, albeit deformed animal in the daylight, but transformed into an upright monster after nightfall. These creatures are thought to be Inuit hunters that traveled too far north and became stuck between the world of the living and the dead. They apparently transformed into evil deformed men with sideways mouths and eyes, they use their power of shapeshifting to hunt other Inuit, especially children. And the people here are wary of wild animals for this very reason. A week following our encounter though, the security team was able to corner the wolf on a remote work site. Apparently it had attacked and trapped two welders in their truck. Both workers had superficial cuts through their snowsuits but were otherwise fine. And having no other choice, the wolf was euthanized on the spot. But security shot the wolf once and instead of dropping dead, it charged the officer that shot it. The wolf took three more high powered rifle shots before eventually it collapsed at the feet of the officer. Even then, paralyzed in the now red snow, the wolf was still growling through its crooked wide smile. After several minutes, Apparently, it finally succumbed to its wounds and it died. The wolf's body was taken to the University of Alaska Fairbanks for dissection and examination. Outside of the facial deformities and gnarled appearance, the biologists concluded that it was a, an ordinary wolf from the Brooks Range Mountains, albeit a rather large one. But how it got hundreds of miles from home and why it stayed on the tundra, that is a complete mystery that the biologist really couldn't explain. Back when I, a female, was in college in Texas, my roommates, one female and two male, and I decided to drive to Boulder CO for spring break. To maximize our time in Boulder, we decided to take shifts and drive all the way through, rather than stopping for overnight stays. It was roughly an 18 hour trip, so I'm driving my shift when we reach the Texas Panhandle in the early morning hours. We're out in the middle of nowhere and have not seen a single car in either direction for ages, when we notice headlights behind us. Car came up on us quickly, then followed behind for some time. Oddly, it would get real close to us, then back off real far, then get close again. This pattern continued for several miles. We're in the car nervously joking about it being a potential deliverance situation set in Texas flatland. When suddenly, the headlights are joined by red and blue police lights. It was so dark out there that we had not seen the light bar on the hood and had not realized that we were being followed by a cop. I check my speedometer and I'm not speeding so we're all wondering why we're getting pulled over but I go ahead and pull to the shoulder. Up comes a cop wearing a cowboy hat to my window. He shines his light in the car and looks us over then asks me to get out of the car. I hesitate at first but there are three other people in the car so I'm not feeling particularly unsafe at this point. I grab my wallet, get out, and stand against the driver door. The cop looks at my license and insurance, then tells me that he's going to do a sobriety test. I'm thinking, what? 
but know that I've had nothing to drink, so I say, okay. The way the cop directed me for the walking in a straight line test had me ending my walk right by his car. When I finished, he reached over to open his back passenger door and then told me to just get in. What? Why? Sit in the car while I look up your license. Now, I had heard how doors on the back of cop cars, they only open from the outside. So I knew that if I got into this car and he closes the door, I will not be able to get out. It's like three in the morning, pitch black darkness on a road dozens of miles from any civilization. And I am not getting in that car. Sir, I'm sorry, but... With all respect, and for my own safety, I do not want to get into the back of your car. What did you say to me? For my own safety, and with all due respect, I'm not sitting in the back of your car. You can call for another officer to come out here, but I just don't feel safe getting in your car, okay? Do you realize that I could arrest you right now for not obeying an order from a police officer? Again, sir, I am not meaning to be disrespectful, but I am not getting into your car. We go back and forth like this for several minutes, him threatening to arrest me, my friends, hold us overnight, etc, etc, and me refusing to get into his car. The cop then leers at me and asks, What? Are you afraid of being kidnapped? And I mean, how messed up is that, right? I glance toward my car and see my friends piled up at the back window watching. The two guys are looking ready to jump out at any moment. The cop turns to look at them too. I don't know what went through his mind, but after being completely aggressive with me for what seemed like forever, he finally gave me a really creepy smile, handed back my license and insurance, tipped his hat, then got into the car and just drove off. At this point, I was shaking so badly that my friends had to help me get back into the car. I don't even remember if he gave me a ticket to be honest. I was just glad that I had not cried in front of this guy, but I totally broke down once I was back in seat. To this day, I still think about this terrible person deciding to terrorize a, a young college female at three in the morning in the middle of rural Texas, and often wonder what would have happened if I had not stood my ground and instead just gotten into that, that cop car. Let's talk real-life horror stories about notorious serial killers like Jack the Ripper. Or keep things on the lighter end with some unexplained encounters in Georgia where mysterious hands are pulling people underwater. It's all a light-hearted nightmare on the Morbid Podcast. Hosted by Elena Urquhart and Ash Kelly, Morbid is a full dose of true crime with a splash of comedy. Personally, I really appreciated how the hosts Elena and Ash retell the stories with care and consideration for the victims' families. It was a huge plus and drew me in quickly. Then when they added the emotion to the stories, it became a fantastic listen. This month, Morbid is celebrating its five-year anniversary. To celebrate, the show is releasing a special anniversary series, a festive edition of listener tales, and more surprises all month long. Follow Morbid wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen early and ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app. This happened when I was 15, near Algonquin Park. My father and I were driving up to our cottage in the middle of winter. I was always really amazed at the beauty of the park and Muskoka in general, and had grown up enjoying the beauty of it every summer. Our cottage was on a large lake, about a 30 minute drive from the nearest town. There were probably thousands of cottages on the lake. During the summer, the lake and the town's population tripled. It was cottage country, so people would spend all summer enjoying the lake and warm nights around the campfires with family and friends. I spent every summer there growing up, and it still brings fond memories of sunshine, laughter, and the sound of a motorboat on the lake. The winters, they were different. The people that didn't live there all year round would venture back home to city life, leaving the area mostly deserted, with cottages boarded up for the winter. 
There were a few people that would still frequently come up every couple of months for a few days or so, but for the most part, the lake was silent during the winters, and the town was just filled with locals. The beautiful pine trees, they're always covered with snow, making the forest quiet. Our cottage was on a dead-end road, but there were about 20 other cottages on the road, with ours being somewhat in the middle. The cottages were quite spaced out, however, with our closest neighbours being too far away to see through the trees. My dad had needed to head up to the cottage to do some painting that my mum had been bugging him to do for some time. It was at the end of February, and it was a long weekend, so I tagged along so that he wouldn't be alone, and we would spend some quality time together and all that. It was about a five-hour drive from our home, but turned out to be an eight-hour drive due to the heavy snow. It had gotten pretty dark out quickly, and it was around midnight as we drove through the park. It was deadly quiet and pitch black, except for the headlights of the car, that is. We finally passed through the park, with only about 30 minutes left to get to the cottage. It had stopped snowing, and we were both eager to get there. As we turned onto the familiar road, I remember my dad cursing. It hadn't been plowed yet. This wasn't surprising, however. It probably wouldn't be until later the next day that we would even see a snow plow. As we drove down the road, I noticed that there was a fresh set of tire tracks. The Smiths must be up for the weekend, my dad had said. All of a sudden, as we drove around the bend, following the tire tracks, the headlights of the car shone on a white van that was parked on the side of the road. It was almost hidden by the vast trees that were covered with snow. What the... My dad mumbled. As we drove past the white van, I remember looking back through the back window and very clearly seeing two figures in the front seat illuminated by our retreating taillights. I told my dad this and he shrugged. Uh, maybe they're lost. I nodded but couldn't help to think about how it was a, a dead end road and why they would feel the need to park there of all places. As we pulled into our driveway and we started bringing our stuff in. I just couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. I couldn't stop thinking about the van and why it was there, with two people just sitting in the dark in the middle of the night like that. It spooked me so much that I begged my dad to let me sleep upstairs with him, instead of sleeping downstairs in the room that my sister and I usually shared. It had big windows with no blinds that looked out into the blackness of the forest and my 15-year-old self was already scared of the dark, even without seeing the white van. It wasn't a big deal when my sister was there, but not this night. As my dad got ready for bed, I sat in the living room reading a book. My dad had turned all the lights off, and I was just using a small lamp next to the couch to try and get through one last chapter before bed. It was so quiet that I could almost hear my ears ringing. And it was then that... I also started to get the feeling that I was being watched. The living room had large windows, also with no curtains, that overlooked the lake, and it was black, except for a light or two from cottages across the lake. I shut off the lamp and I got up. Now that the cottage was dark, the moon was shining brightly, illuminating the snow. It was really beautiful and I walked towards the window to get a better look, and movement caught my eye. And I remember my heart dropping as I saw two figures down by the back porch, below the window, barely hidden by the surrounding trees. I dropped to the floor and crawled towards the bedroom where my dad was sleeping. My heart was in my throat. I wasn't sure if they had seen me or not, but I woke up my dad and by the time that he got to the window, the two figures were gone. Where I had seen the figures though, two sets of footprints in the snow led back around to the front of the cottage and back down the driveway. I begged my dad not to go outside. He double checked the locks and turned on the porch lights, hopefully to scare anyone off. My dad wasn't as freaked out as I was, but still set the alarm before he headed back to bed. I remember being very freaked out and... I lay there all night next to my dad, terrified that I would look out the window and that I would see someone staring back at me. The next morning, my dad went outside and confirmed that 
There were two sets of footprints leading from the road to in behind our cottage and then back around to the front of the cottage and then back up to the road. There were tire marks that showed the vehicle had turned around and then gone back up to the main road. My dad guessed that they were probably looking to break in and steal stuff as it was the middle of winter and not too many people were up at the lake at this point. But they knew that we were there. They would have seen our tire tracks leading to our cottage and my dad's car parked out front. They also may have seen the lamp that I had turned on to read and or seeing it go off. My dad didn't have an answer for that and after much back and forth, he called the non-emergency line and reported it. Apparently, there had been some break-ins in the area and some stuff had been stolen from some cottages that were boarded up for the winter. But again, and I still wonder to this day, why would they be interested in stealing from a house that clearly has people inside of it? So, I'd like to share a strange occurrence from last night with all of you guys and get your thoughts. My wife and I, we put the kids to bed at 9.30 and went to bed ourselves around the usual time of 10.30 or 11. But we were sleeping in a spooning position, sideways on the mattress, which isn't our usual sleeping posture. But since I washed my hair before going to bed, I needed my dreadlocks to hang off to the side and drain any excess water. At an unknown time of the night, still half asleep, semi-conscious, I see our door opening slowly, as if someone is entering our room. I zonk out, again, shortly after I feel a set of tiny hands holding my own, playing with my fingers and palms, as your kid usually would. I'm thinking that it may be my nine-year-old son, but it's highly unlikely, since neither one of my kids go into our room, like ever. They always stay in their own. At the time, I was too tired to respond, so my analytical skills weren't running at full capacity, and I rode it off and dozed off again. Next thing I know, I feel this pulsating force on my back, and a slight buzz in both of my ears, forcing me to slightly open my eyes. And I can see these, like, colorful lights. My eyes are squinting, so the brightness isn't too overwhelming, the colors change as well as the patterns, going from sort of lines to multi-angled shapes, almost like some kind of a, a hallucinogenic effect. For context too, I don't consume anything. No prescription drugs, no street drugs, or any other recreational substances. The last drink that I had was a can of Coke and whiskey last weekend. That's it. I can't tell how long the lights lasted for too, but... It was not a sleep paralysis episode and I didn't feel any kind of anxiety or feeling like being trapped or in danger as most sleep paralysis episodes are like. Soon after I hear my wife say, who opened our door? The doorknob would have had to have been turned in order to open the door by the way. So we are puzzled by how the door could be opened like that. Alarms go off at around 6 in the morning and we begin to regain consciousness time to wake up the kids so they can pack their lunches and get dressed and all that. I tell my wife what I felt in the middle of the night and her eyes get big as she says that she felt a movement on the bed like the weight that she would feel if the cat got into our room which is the reason that we shut our door completely so we won't wake up to the cat purring on our faces. I ask the kids though how they slept and casually ask if they were up for any reason hoping one of them tells me that they got into our room and that that would explain at least the hands touching and the weight on the bed and all that. I could easily write off the lights and the pulsating to very vivid dreams. But they each respond that they slept fine and they didn't leave their rooms. For context too, neither one of them sleepwalks or anything similar. Now even more puzzled, I pull myself together to get ready to drive the kids to school. I brush my teeth and catch myself staring at my reflection. My eyes look sort of empty though and it disturbed me so much I, I couldn't stand looking at myself. I may have psyched myself out but I don't know. Anyway, that is pretty much it. 
and if you have any input, be it humorous or phenomenon, serious spiritual stuff, it's all welcome. This whole thing was so significant that I just had to share it here. Thanks for listening, and like I said, if you have any thoughts, then please do share them. I'm a corrections officer in the Deep South, and I just entered my seventh year working in my facility. I've always been semi-religious, but nothing serious. Just your typical small town church kind of thing. However, I work in a big city jail, and I've had some minor things happen over the years that didn't really make me think ghosts, but it's creepy nonetheless, especially working overnight. It's dark, silent, you're alone most of the time, plus you're usually a little bit drowsy, so I always just chalked it up to that. Some of these small experiences include random footsteps from around my control room when all the inmates are locked up, voices in places that are no longer in use, stuff like this. However, this isn't about any of those minor experiences that I just mentioned. It's about this encounter or experience from around a week ago. I've talked to a couple of close friends and some guys at work, and we can't seem to figure it out. I've tried to wrap my mind around this as best as I can, but I'm honestly at my wit's end. So, I thought that I might as well share it here and see what sticks or if someone can perhaps help me reason with whatever happened. So, for context, the floor that I work is typically a floor reserved for mid-security violent inmates. This would include robbery suspects, domestic violence, assault, etc. Typical night for me is to come in and lock down all inmates for the night and then conduct what we call a, a standing headcount. Basically, I come in and put eyes on every inmate on the floor. If my roster says that I have 170 inmates, I have to physically count 170 inmates. Well, the facility is currently undergoing modernization upgrades. This includes new doors, locks, day space, tables and furniture and stuff like that. And, most importantly, cameras. On my floor, all pods are full to capacity, except for C-Block. This pod is currently locked out, meaning that no inmates are to be housed in the pod until all upgrades are done and in place. They've been working on it for about three weeks now. They've put in all the new doors, locks and cameras. The camera feeds are shown on a small screen inside the control room of the floor, with their cell number placed in the bottom right corner of each cell. So, I shouldn't have to worry about counting in C-Block as there are no inmates in C-Block. Well, one week ago, after finishing my head count, I came back to the control room and I do my usual routine. I pull up Chrome and just browse the internet until I have to do my hourly check to make sure that everyone is okay. At around midnight, I finish doing another check and I sit down in the control room. As I go to sit down, I take a quick glance at the screen with all the cameras. In C block, 4 cell, I swear that I saw a person standing in the center of the cell facing out towards the door of that cell. I do a double take and of course, nothing is there. Okay, so maybe I saw someone in B block standing in this cell or maybe the camera froze for a second. About 30 minutes later, I sit up in my chair as I'm putting my phone down. This time again, I see someone standing in C block 4 cell. And this time, I know that it's that cell because I'm looking at that number. The cell door is wide open, as are all the doors in C block, so it's for sure that cell. I full tilt sprint into that block and look up into 4 cell. But when I do, there's nothing and no one. I begin to think that I must be seeing things or the camera is somehow messing up. I put in a report to our electronic maintenance department and they say they'll look into it. I came back the next night and the report states that all the wiring is fine and that the camera feed is in fact linked to C block 4 cell and everything should be fine. After going home and thinking about it, I convinced myself that I was wrong somehow, that it was just me being tired. Again, 
Same process comes and goes, lockdown, headcount, back to the control room to wait. I'm now glancing every once in a while at C-Block 4 cell. Nothing appears. Midnight comes and goes and I think, okay, yeah, it must have been me. But then, two o'clock rolls around and again I do my check, sit back down in the control room. Again, all the doors in C-Block are all the way open and these doors are not light. They are big metal doors, easily 60 to 70 pounds. And that is when C Block 4 cell slams shut. Then, after it is shut and now locked, it sounds like it's starting to be kicked by a horse or something. Like someone slammed it shut right on the back end of a full grown horse. I look on the camera screen and all the cameras in that pod are just blinking on and off. I go into the block and as I'm going up the stairs towards the door, more doors start to shut. From 6 to 5, 3, 2, 1. At this point, I'm just done. I ran out of that block, shut the door and called for a supervisor and maintenance. We checked the footage of the event on the supervisor's computer in his office. And of course, none of them show anything. At around the 2 o'clock mark... They all just go to no connection with our local server at the HQ building across the street. When maintenance went to check everything, they did say that it was definitely not the lock, but it did look like someone had tried to kick that door off its hinges because the door frame itself had chipped paint after having just freshly painted it. I've scoured incident reports back to five years and... I cannot find anything about any violent deaths or just anyone dying in general on this floor. That being said, my department has sealed reports in the past where if you're under an LT, you won't be able to read the report anyway. So, I'm not sure. I'm still working on this floor. They are on their last few days of fixing up C block and then they'll move to D block. They still have three more blocks after D-Block to do, so I'm a little bit concerned of what will happen once these are empty and not in use. Things in C-Block seem to have calmed down as nothing major has happened since last week. Doors still move and I've had to shut, but not like that night a week ago. I've put in for vacation towards the end of May as well, so I'm hoping that maybe some time away will help and hopefully it'll be a fix by then. But I must admit that this, it's turned me from a, a non-believer to a skeptic on the low end to a, a possible believer on the high end. I just don't think that the AC could blow a, a 60 pound door shut, nor could it cause the door to be hit that violently, so much that the paint chipped. If anyone has a similar experience or has any ideas, then please do let me know. I work in the woods for a living here in the western US, lately as a fire lookout, in a remote location. I'm talking a three mile hike to a mostly abandoned dirt road and another hour drive before you even hit pavement. This was last summer. It was around 11pm on a moonless night. Pitch black outside and the lights of the town 30 miles away have mostly dimmed at this point. It was a relatively calm night, very little wind. The tower sits atop a, a more or less bald spot, atop a, a lower peak in the middle of a burn scar. There's really not much in the immediate area, besides some long grass and a smattering of younger fir trees. And at around 11pm, I'm sitting there under the glow of a propane light out on the porch, finishing a book. I suddenly hear a rustling coming from down the hill to the south, maybe about 20 degrees down from where I was sitting. It was just barely audible and sounded like it was maybe 300 feet away. It was very sudden and sent a shiver up my spine, but I went back inside, grabbed my flashlight to have a look around from the catwalk. There was nothing at all out there in that direction that I could immediately detect. But then I saw it. Well, I saw something. To this day, I'm really still not certain what it was, to be honest. But what I do know is that it wasn't a trick of the light or my eyes or anything. 
I had looked at that exact spot the next few nights and never saw it again, but I know my home like the back of my hand. Every tree, every shrub, this was not that. Out in the distance, next to a lone boundary tree, was a vague shape, dark and ill-defined, despite the surrounding area being relatively in focus. It looked to be about maybe four or five feet tall, roundish, definitely wider than the tree, roughly human-shaped, but not quite right, like it was some memory of what a human looks like from someone who hasn't seen another one in a long time. It was hunched over, and I watched it for what felt like forever. It didn't move, not initially, but after a bit, it shifted slowly to my right behind the tree, and then it was gone, and I never saw it again. Now, the weird thing is that I should have been able to see it behind the skinny tree, and if it went down the hill or the side of the hill, I would have seen it. Like I said, this relatively small snag was on its own, on a relatively gentle downslope, so the fact that it just sort of went around the tree and disappeared like that just doesn't make any sense. Now, this is an area with a lot of animals, mostly white-tailed deer and wild cows. We have some black bears, some elk, some cougars, and even some wolves, but they don't tend to let themselves be seen, and they tend to skitter off when they learn that they're being observed as well. I've seen the predators before, but never that close to my tower. The whitetails and the elk come up, but there's little in terms of food. People are known to come here from time to time, but it's really rare. We also have visitors and hunters, but my location in particular is only really known to locals and doesn't exist on public maps or anything. The official start of the extremely overgrown, hard to follow, and obviously abandoned trail is about two miles after a locked and unmarked gate. Hunters, they don't tend to come up here because the animals don't tend to come too close. Poachers wouldn't because they're aware that we report to law enforcement. So, all of this is to say that I have no idea what that was, but boy, did it freak me out. It still freaks me out a little to this day even, and I really hope that it was just a person or an animal in some weird circumstance, but I'm not so sure about that. What I do know is that I don't feel too comfortable sitting outside after dark here anymore. Through my life, I've had several experiences that could be considered paranormal, but due to my personality traits, I'm not good at sharing stuff like this. I'm an atheist, and I sort of believe in paranormal events, I guess. I mean, at least they're a possibility in my mind. But for me, the paranormal is something that we can interact with, or it can interact with us for different reasons, and it has been described to me a bit like a receptor for that something that might be there. That being said, here's my experience. So a few years ago, I was living in this old apartment. It was in good shape, but you can easily tell how old it was by just looking at it. During all my time there, I always felt this, I don't know, like bad vibes, I guess. And I had several experiences there. One of them happened during the night. I was sleeping in a king-size bed with my girlfriend. We always slept in the middle of the bed, and as you know, a king bed is quite a wide bed. At some point during the night, I started to wake up, and as I recall, I was in this waking up moment when you can't tell if you're still sleeping or sort of already awake. But I just had this feeling of someone else was in the room with us. And as I was opening my eyes, I felt like I fell out of bed, just harder, like I wasn't pushed from it, but thrown from it. I opened my eyes and found myself about maybe three or four feet from my bed, and my girlfriend was in a panic, looking at me, asking how the heck I got there, and what was that loud sound? Me hitting the floor, apparently. But I look at my arm, and it had some kind of mark that you get when something grabs you hard. It was like a, a hand mark, just way bigger than my own. Putting the marks aside though, to this day I try to think on how I possibly was able to do what I did that night. How I was able to just fling myself out of the bed like that. 
Like I said, it was a king-size bed, so to be honest, it just seems impossible. And it wasn't like my girlfriend could throw me out of the bed like that. I'm just too big for her to do that. I really don't know what to believe about this, because I just haven't come up with a good explanation yet. I was 16 when this first happened, and it occurred around January, just after Christmas. My family went on vacation, and they left me in the house with my dad, and my mum and sisters were on vacation with my aunts. We didn't hire a house sitter to watch over the house because of previous house sitter robberies, so me and my dad and I were the only ones left home. It was Thursday, maybe around 9 o'clock. I liked staying up at night, plus my dad wasn't home, his work shift was extended. But it was at around that time that something weird happened. I think it was around 9.30 and I recall that my dog was scratching the door so I fixed his collar and walked him out to do his business while watching him. And I remember seeing a vaguely strange man walking through the suburban streets and at first I didn't really mind him and was back to doing my business but... At around like maybe 9.45, 15 minutes later, I was going back inside when I saw another man walking again while closing the door. He seemed to be walking a bit more slowly and if I can recall correctly, I think it was the same man walking from before. So after I took care of my dog, I was planning to go to sleep. But something about me seeing that guy just, I don't know, it got to me and kept me up. So instead I decided to stay up until 10 to see if he would come back but really didn't see anything at that time so in the end I just went back to going to sleep. At around 11 or 12 though, something like that, I just randomly woke up to my dad calling me. He was wondering if I was still awake and of course I wasn't. I was a little bit irritated because I was already asleep and why would he call at such a time as this but... While we were talking, my eyes slowly turned over to the window, and there he was, the same man again, but he was just standing there, leaning at the lamppost, and I think now he was smoking. When I rubbed my eyes, I saw that it was the same man from before, so I was a little bit surprised, but I didn't tell my dad about the man on the phone. After the convo, though, with my dad on the phone, I went downstairs to peek if the front door was locked. It was, but I just felt a little bit uneasy at the time. I went back upstairs and peeked through my window. The man was still there staring, looking at the house. And I could feel that he knew that I was staring at him. I didn't go back to sleep too because of that. I had a bad feeling, so I grabbed the baseball bat that my little brother was using for baseball practice and kept it beside me. I was stressing out like anything at that time and was shaking softly, but I wanted to call 911, but I was afraid that I'd only waste my time by reporting something that I don't really have clear evidence on. And right at that moment, I can still remember that day too, when he started to brisk walk up to my house and I immediately just jumped up and went into fight or flight mode. I raced downstairs to stay there and when I heard the knocks, I immediately called my dad and told him to check his ring doorbell camera and he saw the man too. He was a little confused at first and thought that me and my friends were pulling a prank on him but when he started knocking, I just hung up on him and started going back downstairs carefully when I arrived at the front door. I stood there holding the bat really tight and asked who was there. He then spoke and... He said that he was a, a solicitor for, I don't know, some solicitor from some place. But I mean, who knocks at like 12 in the morning? So I asked him to get away from our property kindly, but he just wouldn't leave. After a few minutes, my dad sent me a screenshot of the man at our front door and in full caps said, who is that? I just ignored the message. I was guarding the front door. He started knocking on the door more vigorously and aggressively and I clutched the bat ready to swing. I heard another notification on my phone. I checked later and it was my dad saying that he was coming home to check on me. 
but the man at that moment started kicking on the door and it was aggressive. I tried telling him to leave angrily but he ignored it and kept on continuing. After a few seconds he stopped and I checked my upstairs bedroom window and see that he was sprinting away from the house and saw headlights entering the driveway. I was struck with relief when I saw my dad coming out of the pickup. After that, he called 911 and told them about the incident and hung up. We posted his face on social media for awareness, but in the end, that's really all that happened. The guy never returned, thankfully, but still, the whole thing definitely had me shook up for quite some time. So, things have gotten a bit crazy with my girlfriend's sleeping problems. I've been seeing this girl a, a little under a year. It's a great relationship. I think I'm going to marry her, in fact. But she sleepwalks, and I always find her standing at the door. Not going in it or not, just standing still there. She also has a four-year-old son who I adore, and vice versa. But honestly... He has woken up at 2.11 on the dot the past month every single night, crying and wanting to come into bed with us. One night, he woke up screaming and crying worse than normal. He will always stand at the threshold of our door crying for one of us to come and get him. And he will not cross the threshold under any circumstance unless we physically come and pick him up. Side note too... We leave the room open all day and he is in and out of there all day, so it's a bit strange. But anyway, the other night, he woke up at 2.11 like usual. But the only difference is, when I picked him up to lay with us, he claimed that there was a man in the corner. I checked, even though I could see that there wasn't. I did it to comfort him because I could see the said corner and tell that there was nothing there. But then he insisted that we go out of the room until the man in the corner was gone. The whole time he had a look of terror on his face and I just have no idea what to do about any of this. Also, a couple of times I've woken up to my girlfriend pointing at the corner of the room. I don't know if the two things are related but it seems a, a bit fishy, that's for sure. I, a 25-year-old female, work graveyard shift at a nursing facility. It's essentially a residential home for those who are nearing the end of their life, who've gone into transition or are in hospice. The first place I've ever worked where it feels so incredibly alive, despite the residents being so close to the end. But when I first started, I saw things before I heard about it. On my first night... I saw a shadowy woman silhouette pass behind my co-worker who was talking to me and disappear into the closed bathroom door. In front of the bathroom door is the main exit way which is wired with an alarm that you need a code to get into. The door itself is heavy too. Think the automatic doors you see in the hospitals. The door alarm was tripped at around 2am so thinking that a resident might have wandered we ran from the nurse's station to reset the alarm and get them back into bed. Except when we got there, the door was wide open and the alarm shut off once we got close to it. We did a head count and every single resident on that floor was asleep and accounted for. We eventually were able to laugh about it until the next morning first shift came in and warned me about the uninvited guests that stay on campus. Since then, I've had a plethora of experiences there. The most common phenomena is the man in black and the woman in white, as well as the kids in the courtyard. Apparently, the man in black is a benign thing and he usually pops up at around the time that people are about to expire. Our lead nurse thinks that he guides people to the afterlife and takes away the good ones. Then there's the woman in white. She's apparently of some evil origin. Certain residents who are about to expire report that they see her in their rooms, days leading up to their expiration. They say that her presence is accompanied by a feeling of being set on fire or burning. 
And there's a theory that this woman in white drags you to whatever the bad place is in the afterlife. One of our hospice patients passed away very recently, in fact, and just before she did, one of our nurses reported that she felt a, a tall, dark, shadowy figure come up close behind her. When she turned her head, there was nothing there, so we can only hope that the patient went to the good place with the man in black. I have many more stories. Mostly I need to tell them so that I can finally put them out of my mind and possibly get some input on what this activity could be, but I'll save those for another time. For now, this will have to do. A few years ago, I was at the grocery store and I had finished up and was walking down the center aisle toward the checkouts at the front. Up ahead, standing in the middle of the aisle with his back to the display, facing the produce, was an older man. Normal looking, normally dressed, maybe 60-ish I would guess. Looked like he was just standing there waiting for someone too. I looked at him as I walked toward him and he slowly turned his head toward me. And I swear that he had completely solid black eyes, even the whites of the eyes where they should be. I instantly felt this immense fear and dread. I turned my cart to the right and started running down the aisle behind the greeting cards, like seriously running. I was terrified because it just did not look natural. He didn't do anything, didn't move, just looked at me, but I eventually made it up the front checkout and left. I had never before or since experienced something like that and I'm 45 now, especially that feeling of dread that I got. I mean, I'm a people person. I probably look like a dork walking around the grocery smiling at people, but hey, that's just me. And if he had been normal looking, I would have smiled and said hi. I've only ever found a couple of stories online that were somewhat similar. Lots of stuff about children with black eyes, but not adults. The story that I've seen about the guy at the rest stop was most similar to what I experienced, especially the dread. And I'm just wondering, has anybody else experienced something like this? Or are there any diseases or anything that could have caused something like this? If you have any ideas, then I would love to hear them. When I was around 15, me and my friends were driving around going to all the haunted places around the Uinta Basin. It was getting close to Halloween, so as is tradition, but we were all trying to scare each other like we always did. First, we went to a place called the Haunted Woods. This is an actual business, not a place in the woods. Then we went to an abandoned hotel near the Ute Reservation. Nothing of significance happened there. We didn't see or hear anything and we were just sort of goofing around and having a bit of fun. Then the driver says that we're going to Skinwalker Ranch. Now, I had never heard of Skinwalker Ranch before this, but I had heard plenty of stories of Skinwalkers. I was intrigued at first, but as we dropped down the hill back behind the property, I don't know, a, a feeling of dread settled on me like a, a heavy blanket. Everyone in the car got more and more quiet, like they were feeling the heaviness too. I don't think we should go there, I spoke softly. Oh, we're going. The driver announced. There's no moon tonight and no flashlights allowed. He continued. I'll just stay in the truck then. I have a really bad feeling about this and I don't want to go. I spoke again. You are not staying in my truck alone. Now get out, he said rudely. I got out of the truck and looked over at my best friend. Her face was white and her eyes were wide and round and I knew that she felt the same way that I did. We really shouldn't be here. The driver of the truck said that this was the back end of the huge ranch. I wouldn't have believed him that this really was Skinwalker Ranch if I didn't feel that it was in every nerve ending of my body. He walked over to what looked like an ancient post and pole fence, undid the loop of wire holding up a small gate, and laid it on the ground. There was an overgrown two-track road leading up into the darkness and we followed as he led us up it. The horrible feeling of dread was 
almost overwhelming at this point and I felt like I was about to be sick. I wanted to go running back to the truck but I had a deep fear that something would pounce the moment that I left the safety of the group. We weren't laughing and joking here anymore. That heaviness was weighing on all of us now and we walked silently through the dark. As we walked I tried to keep my eyes on my feet but I would occasionally glance to either side of the two track road. Each time I did I would see a huge black mass out in the tall grass that I could have sworn was moving. I told myself that it must just be a cow but each time that I looked at it it was in the same spot off to the left following our journey to the old homestead. Finally the driver and the leader of our ghoulish expedition stopped and said that we were almost to the old homestead, that we needed to stay quiet in case the owners were around. As he turned to start walking again, a growl leapt from the darkness and he stopped and took a step back. He wasn't our fearless leader anymore. His voice shook as he told us that it was time to head back to the truck. We walked a little ways and then one of our group said that they needed to use the bathroom. We stopped by a small stream running along the south end of the property. I was smoking and talking to one of my friends about how relieved I was that we were finally leaving. I glanced down at the stream at the same time my friend did, just in time to see a black figure emerging from the water. It was not a cow. It was not a coyote either. It looked like it was way too skinny and too tall. We both screamed and ran back on the road and... That was the last straw for everyone, but we all ran the entire way back to the truck at this point. Now, a few months later, this adventure had slowly left my mind. I had started to convince myself that the figures in the darkness, they were just cows and that it probably was just the dark running water playing tricks on my eyes, making me see things emerging from the water that weren't really there. My best friend had come over to my house to sit outside and mess around a bit, smoke some cigarettes and whatnot. We did this pretty frequently at this point. We lived in the middle of nowhere, so dumb things like this were about as much fun as we could have. So we're just sitting in her car, just across the road from my house. Her car is pointed towards the town park, which was just about a block away from my house. There were no other houses on the way to the park, so with the street lamps on at the park, you can basically see everything up there. Oh, look, a deer, my friend says suddenly. I could see a, a set of glowing eyes now on the very far end of the park. Oh yeah, there it is, I reply. We watch as it slowly walks towards the center of the park. In this spot is a huge metal slide or jungle gym thing. It's probably about 10 to 12 feet, I would guess. But as this deer is walking, I notice that for some reason I can't make out any features of the deer. It seems to almost always be just out of reach of the street lamps that are dotted throughout the park. The deer is right next to the slide when suddenly it stands up. The eyes that were watching are suddenly even with the platform of the slide, which would make this deer at least 10 to 12 feet tall. Then it seems to start walking on its hind legs. Me and my friend, we both start panicking. That is not a deer. We keep watching this extremely tall creature cross the park when my friend decided that we're driving up there. She locks the doors and we head towards the park. When we're almost there, the eyes had now crossed the street and went into the neighborhood across from the park. And by the time that we actually got to the location, whatever was there, it had vanished. Another few months go by, the event had definitely rattled us and there was no convincing ourselves that it was a deer at this point. I mean, deer do not walk on their hind legs like that and they're definitely not 10 feet tall. One night though, I'm at the same friend's house. This friend lived smack dab in the middle of a huge farmland. All around her were pastures and it was really peaceful most of the time. We had spent the night watching movies and hanging out. I went and started my car and we were smoking together on her porch before I left. But we were just chatting when suddenly her eyes leave my face and look behind me and her eyes grow really wide. I turn to look and see 
two glowing red eyes just past the fence into our neighbor's pasture. What the heck is that? I managed to squeak out. I don't know, she whispers back. The eyes remained fixed on us for about 30 seconds, then turned to the left, seemed to blink, and vanished. With that, we both ran back into the house and I didn't dare go back home for at least another 45 minutes. If my car hadn't had already been started, I probably wouldn't have left at all to be honest. Now, a couple of years after these events, I was speaking with a Ute tribal member that I worked with and she said something that gives me goosebumps to this day. She told me that it isn't what's on the ranch that you should be afraid of, it's what follows you when you leave that you need to be worried about. I am convinced that something followed us from Skinwalker Ranch and those terrifying events were something warning us to never go back. I never did and believe me, I never will. In 2014, I flew from Sydney to Belfast in order to attend the wedding of a business associate's son with a week of face-to-face -face business meetings following. It was a bit of a nightmare to get there with the transit through Singapore getting disrupted by Ivis getting sucked through one of the engines as we landed. Despite this though, I managed to get to the wedding just in time. The next day, however, everything caught up with me. The long nights, the major time zone change, and the numerous Bushmills whiskies that I drank at the reception had forced me to delay a meeting and take a nap in my hotel during the middle of the day. I didn't want to stay asleep for too long and risk a sleepless night, so when I woke up after what felt like about an hour, I was keen to get right out of bed and not risk falling back to sleep. Problematically though, I couldn't move. I tried and tried and tried again, putting every bit of willpower into breaking the paralysis. And then I heard a loud bang. This immediately broke the paralysis and quickly I looked up to see one of the large floor to ceiling window panes in my room had shattered into tiny little pieces. Something about it felt very causal, as the explosion seemed to happen at the exact same time that I was putting in every bit of effort into breaking this paralysis or whatever it was. It was almost just like how cartoons or movies might depict someone with supernatural powers impacting things around them when they're just really angry or trying to put all their effort into some kind of magical action. Weirdly too, the night before, I was put on a table with randoms at the wedding reception and one of the guys who worked for a window company was there and he mentioned that on very rare occasions, double glazed windows will explode and require replacement. Now, to hear someone talk about exploding windows just the night before and to have one occur in my room less than 24 hours later seems like a, a very bizarre coincidence, right? In any case, I called reception and they were initially very alarmed by what I had reported to them, misunderstanding it to be some kind of IED that had gone off. A guy from the hotel then came up and moved me to a new room and explained that people get jumpy around here when you mention explosions due to the troubles. In fact, he explained that the hotel itself had been the target of a bombing many decades ago with a, a number of fatalities. Anyway, I really don't know what to make of any of this, but it's definitely one of the strangest things to happen in my life. I, a 36-year-old female, grew up in a suburb in LA. We rented a small house that had two bedrooms in the back and a main living space and kitchen up front. My brother had one bedroom and I had the other, while my parents lived in the main living area. Now, when I was about seven or eight, my father and brother were away on a camping trip with the Boy Scouts. Since the boys were away too, my mum and I decided to have a girls' night and stay up late playing games and whatnot. It was probably about one in the morning. Yes, way too late for me to be up, but that's my parents for you. When I went to go and get another board game for my bedroom, and when I stepped into my room, for some reason I just had the worst feeling of dread just come over me. I'll never forget that feeling too, 
It still gives me goosebumps when I think about it. I walked over to my dresser where the board games were, and where a doll my grandmother had given me was. It was a porcelain doll with a big fancy dress on a little stand, so it looked like she was sort of standing up. And sensing that something felt terribly wrong, and perhaps trying to comfort myself, I reached over and pat the doll's dress and said, It's okay, Dolly, or something like that. And as soon as I did it, one of the doll's legs shot straight up in the air. I screamed instantly, and I ran out of that room. Years later, my mum told me that strange things used to happen all the time while we lived in that house, but my parents would try to hide it from my brother and me. For instance, one time a pan just randomly flew off the stove and they just played it off like it was normal. Cabinets would also randomly be opened, lights would flicker, that sort of thing. We didn't live there much longer, but I never did set foot again in that room. My brother helped me destroy the doll, but looking back, I'm pretty sure that the doll was probably just a vessel for whatever else was living in that house. I've tried to find out the history of the house, but it was destroyed during Katrina, and I'm really unable to find anything out about it. Now, I can be pretty skeptical about these things, but I always go back to that moment and realize that anything can happen. So me and my brother, we shared a room, and we were around 10 years old. My bed being on one side of the room and his bed being on the opposite side. It was really dark and I was staring up at my ceiling waiting for that drowsy feeling to creep in. I remember too, clear as day, my bed just bouncing three times. Like somebody was underneath my bed and started kicking the mattress from underneath the frame. It was brief and violent, only three times. But I got up immediately and looked at my little brother, whose eyes were locked on what was underneath my bed. And he told me that there was something there, and when I went to check, it was just our basketball. The ball, though, was bouncing as if it had just been dropped two seconds prior to me checking underneath my bed. And, quite frankly, there is simply no logical explanation as to what happened and how. When I'm alone with my thoughts... I think about it, and genuinely become stressed about it too. I'm 24 now, and I called him recently to see if it was a fake memory, but no, he confirmed that it actually happened, and he also had no possible explanations. He also has slight variations, though, as to what he remembers, being that our room wasn't that dark that night because our blinds were open, thus letting moonlight in. He said the space under my bed was unnaturally dark though, and he describes it as a, a thick and impenetrable darkness, and didn't think anything of it, until my bed started bouncing violently. That was when he started staring intently at the space under my bed, and said that he saw something. When I was 18, 2005, my mum was giving me a ride to work one day. My car had got impounded for something stupid and I had to wait 30 days to get it back. In the meantime, my mum was giving me rides to work. Now, on Saturdays I worked morning shifts, so I had to be at work by 5am. That means that we had to leave the house no later than 4.30. So, it was still dark outside, like pitch black in fact, and very cold. That morning, as my mum drove me to work, from a distance I could see a figure getting ready to cross the road, basically jaywalk in front of us. As we got closer, I could see that it was a young girl. I thought to myself, ah, caught her doing the walk of shame, huh? She had no shoes, a long white skirt like she was wearing a man's white tee. It was really big on her, and it looked like she had no pants on, but you could barely see that she had these sort of short jean shorts under her large shirt. Like the kind that used to be pants, but she cut herself to make into shorts. She wasn't wearing shoes too, but my mum started talking in Spanish, like what kind of girl walks around the streets at this hour dressed like that. She was walking now in the middle of the street too, super slow at that point. My mum had to stop like 10 feet away from her too because she was still in the street, now blocking us. 
When my mum stopped though, the girl came to a complete stop too, but wasn't facing us. She was facing in the direction that she was crossing, crossing from right to left. And as we now were close, I could see her skin was odd, like a real bluish grey colour. Her hair was black and it looked sort of wet as well and tangled like she just got out of a shower. My mum was about to honk at her when she slowly turns her head to look right at us. Her hair was covering her face and she honestly looked like the girl from the ring for a moment. But the part that I'll never forget was that she moved her hair out of the way and I swear to you that she had no face, like nothing. It was all completely smooth, like Slender Man sort of. No eyes, no mouth, no nose, nothing. It just looked smooth. My mum started to have a panic attack. I literally felt my heart drop. I now was focused on calming my mum down. The girl looked at us for about two or three seconds, and then she took off running. She didn't move at irregular speeds or anything, but she was definitely off now. And quite honestly, I've never seen anything like that in my life. To this day, my mum and I really can't explain what it was. I mean, I guess it could be just a prank or something, but honestly, who would do something like that? I guess I'm just sharing my story as well in the hopes that maybe somebody else has seen something similar. Something with no face. For context... I'm a woman living alone in my apartment. It's located on the ground floor, and so my balcony is very visible to other people. Like every night, I work at 4 in the morning, so I leave at around 3.40am. Unfortunately in France, they decide to turn off the lights from about 8pm to like 6am I think. But thankfully for me, the landlord where I live turned on the lights just for me from 3am to 4am. It's very dim, but I'm thankful for it still. And this Thursday night, I leave like always. Got in my car, locked it, turned on my lights, and something caught my eye. So I looked up, and I thought that I just saw a, a cat jumping from my balcony because they love to come by just to look around and leave. But then I took another look, and it was no cat. It was a man standing next to my balcony. I think that the light surprised him and I'm looking at him walking away from me on the grass but he can't leave that way so I'm just sort of staring at him scared and calmly crying not knowing what to do for like 10 seconds but then I see movement again and it's him walking towards me looking at me quickly and then I just continue walking to the main road like nothing happened. He takes one last look at me in my car before I lose sight of him. Also, he was wearing black sweatpants and a camo jacket, which is weird, right? I don't know what he was doing here, if he was sleeping on my plastic sofa on my balcony or I don't know, but I can't help stop thinking about his face looking at me or what would have happened if it was pitch black outside or I don't know. I wanted to make a report to the police, but they said that they can't because there was no damage. The lady also told me, no, but maybe it wasn't for you, and maybe he was looking around for uh, somebody else's dwelling or something. And I said, at this hour and in this outfit? I don't think so. And then she replied, no, I'm talking robbery. And I'm like, yeah, duh, Sherlock. Since then, every night... I run like crazy to my car with a pepper spray in my hand. Also, I bought surveillance cameras on my balcony just to check before going out at night because now I'm super paranoid and I'm kind of developing OCD, I think. I have to look and check outside before going to sleep every night. But, yeah, is there anything else I should do to keep myself safe? A couple of weeks ago, my dad shared this story with me. My dad, for context too, is about as down to earth and grounded as they get. So, 
Him, his then high school girlfriend, his friend with girlfriend in tow, and another male friend would drive out to the back roads. The roads that we're talking about are pretty desolate. You could go through the night without seeing another car there, in fact. They would randomly stop up and put some tunes on and just do what teens do. This is in the late 70s as reference, and one night, they stopped and were hanging out, when in the field about maybe 500 yards away, a total of five lights shone spaced about 50 yards from each other and roughly 20 feet off the ground. My dad said that they all just stared because the lights were so brilliant, but really didn't hurt their eyes strangely. Roughly 50 seconds after being on, they went off without a sound. They were all discussing what it was when, once again, the lights came in again. This time, they noticed three people standing about 50 yards in front of the lights, just standing, no movement. Lights turned back off. My dad said that they were not scared since it seemed so far away from them. Lights go back on and the initial three people have moved up roughly 50 yards and there is now five more behind them, about 50 yards away sort of like a bowling pin arrangement. Lights go back off. At this point, while still kind of watching, my dad and his friends are packing up to nope out of there. The lights come back on and there is the initial eight people still in the same position, but now one single person is about 200 yards away, right in the middle of the light spectrum. That was when they floored it out of there. No one looked back and it was never spoken of amongst the friends. My dad said that it was some sort of a production to spook five high schoolers, he thinks. It was well accomplished. But all of this happened within about a three to five minute period of time. And I had to ask, did you see the lights for a fourth time while driving away? And he said that they were also shook up that they would not have even noticed, to be honest. Because they just wanted to get out of there and did not want to see them again. So the year was 2018, me and three other friends, we were all males in our early 20s, decided to travel to Bali for about a week since it was cheap and we had time so why not. Our itinerary includes sightseeing, trying local foods, mountain climbing, visiting bars at the beach, basically a typical vacation in Indonesia. It was honestly quite a surreal experience too. The country is absolutely beautiful and the food was amazing. The only issue that I had about the trip were the locals. Drugs were really prominent there, especially shrooms. The streets were filled with users dying to sell us their drugs. I'm not exaggerating when I say this too, but one dude even grabbed my arm because I ignored his two-for-one deal for a one-way trip to meet Jesus apparently. I shrugged him off while my friends laughed it off suggesting that I may be passing up a chance to meet our Lord and Savior. He looked rabid and frantic, like he was about to pounce onto me like a dog diagnosed with rabies or something. I didn't feel too afraid as we were confident that we could handle them since half of them were not even sober, but that is only the tip of the iceberg, let me tell you. The horror starts when we went back to our Airbnb for the night. You see, we had an early day the next morning and were pretty exhausted. The place was extremely cheap and didn't even have a proper locking mechanism for the door. It had two wooden doors which sort of swung inwards and the only way to lock them was to wedge a wooden block through the holes mounted on the door. It was quite a primitive lock but it got the job done I suppose. Everything was going well too until the last night of our trip when we realized that the wooden block was now missing. We looked everywhere for it too but to no avail. I just figured that one of us must have misplaced it somewhere. We settled for using a selfie stick. I know it sounds like a horrible idea. Instead, since we didn't have anything that fit the hole to wedge the door close. We turned in for the night, seemingly not expecting anything since we had already stayed there for six days with no issues. But I woke up to a strange clicking sound in the dead of the night. I got out of bed and I thought maybe it was one of the guys, so I sort of nonchalantly approached the noise. My friends were all sleeping, so 
I decided to investigate the cause of the noise, and the ruckus seemed to be coming from the door, so I headed towards them feeling extremely confused. I mean, who could be at our doorstep at this time of the night? I noticed the doors were slightly opened, and the selfie stick was horribly deformed at this point. I peeked outside, and that was when I saw three people staring through the gap between the doors. They were really close to the entrance and were attempting to push the doors open. I instantly yelled at them questioning their intentions as I noticed one of them was holding the wooden block. I was shocked and puzzled at the situation as I recognized one of the men. He did the overall cleaning for the Airbnbs and pathways during the day so there was really no reason for him to be there at 3am. The other dude asked if the wooden block belonged to us as they allegedly found it outside of our Airbnb. I definitely smelt lies at this point, as there was absolutely no reason to do that at 3 in the morning. I called for my guys, and the three men immediately ran for it at this point. I clue in the guys on the circumstances, and we stayed up until morning, just in case they tried anything funny. We decided to report this to the reception, though, about their employee, but the description that I gave them... They apparently were not synonymous with theirs. They told me that the housekeepers that they hired consisted only of females in their late 30s and 40s. This instantly sent shivers down our spines as we came to realize that we had let a complete imposter in and out of our rooms while we were out. Luckily, nothing important was lost and we got out of the situation safely, but that does beg the question. Why didn't they steal anything? I must admit that I was grateful that it was our last night there because I really don't know how I would have gone spending another night in that place. It all started about a month ago when a man started banging on my door at 6 at night yelling for Mike to come out. That... He needs to see him and get cigarettes. I told him that he had the wrong house and to leave. There has never been a mic in this house. He got even more aggressive though, calling me a liar and how he was going to come in and beat the skinny living whatever out of me and I tried to call the non-emergency police line because I've never called 911 before and they didn't even pick up. Looking back, it was stupid but it was instinct but... After some more yelling, eventually he leaves. I called my father who was across town to come home and what was going on and he showed up. He called 911 to file a report. The guy came back and started screaming at him though. Cops were called again, showed up half an hour after the call and couldn't find him and told me to defend myself if it came to it. I ended up staying with a friend for the night because I didn't think I would feel safe at home. I, can be a strong person, but I just don't think that I can do much against a, a drugged out man like that. What made the situation even scarier to me though is that as I was going through my driveway camera photos, it shows him walking up to my house hours before and I didn't even have any idea about this. I have really bad anxiety, so the next few days were filled with paranoia and stress, but I managed to finally calm down and convince myself that that was the end of it. Come that weekend, my father went on a trip with his girlfriend, so I was left alone for a couple of days. I just put on a scary movie when I heard screaming again and a loud bang. I pull up my camera and see that he's back, pacing back and forth on the sidewalk and has thrown over our trash can. Again, this guy's screaming for Mike and I call 911 and they show up within minutes this time and are able to stop him down the street. They tell me that there's really nothing that they can do since he hasn't committed a crime yet, but if he comes back to call them again and then they'll have more reason to hold him. Things were quiet for a few weeks too, and so I again believe that that was the end of it. Until today. This morning my father and I got into an argument, so I wanted to take a walk to clear my mind. I went across the street to a park and sat by a tree watching cars pass every now and then and it was beautiful morning weather. I noticed a truck drive down the left side of the park and turned to the street my back is facing. 
he waved as he passed, so I did too, thinking that it was just a man going to work. I wanted to show that I was okay, thinking that that might have been what he was asking about. He then pulls off into the right side of the park, stops, makes a U-turn to come back. Red flags instantly go off in my head, so I get up to start walking home. I look back and see that he's turned off his headlights and is trailing me. I get to the front of my house and he slows. I get a, a better look at his face this time and it looks like the man that had been harassing me. From the physical characteristics to his red baseball cap, he just glared at me like I took everything in his life away from him. I get to the door and try to barge in but my father put the chain on in anger of me walking out so I had to yell to him that I was being followed and to open the door. He opens it and by then the truck was gone and it was down the street. Now I'm terrified to leave my home. I don't have a car to get anywhere quickly. I have to bike but even now I'm scared to do that. I don't know who that man is or what his deal is or what his intentions are, but I live in paranoia just waiting to find out. In December of 2005, me and a few high school friends were back home from our respective universities. We were juniors at the time and started a traditional winter break of freshman year to visit random state, parks or smaller towns and explore them, along with the occasional mischief that we would end up getting into at some point. During these one night trips, the three of us would all fall asleep in the back of my Tahoe on a large mattress pad. This kept us safe from the elements and set my paranoid mind at ease should we be subjected to any foul play as well. But we decided this year to go to the Davy Crockett National Forest area. This area has many places that are extremely rural and desolate, which was exciting because we had previously found some interesting things and abandoned structures on our previous excursions. I'd used up my rest of my university printing credits to print detailed map quest pages for us so that we could use them for navigation while we were visiting. The drive was roughly two hours from our hometown. We decided to start the trip off in Lufkin, just east of the National Forest, to eat dinner and get a few things from Walmart. After dinner, we decided to mess around and get into our normal shenanigans like we always did. A few hours later, we found ourselves in Crockett, Texas, about an hour west of Lufkin. We planned on staying in a campground about halfway between the two cities, so had a lot of flexibility when it came to time. We explored random roads and went into a few abandoned buildings before getting bored and wanting to go somewhere else. By this time, it was about 12.30, in the morning that is, and at this point in the night, I needed an energy boost, so decided to stop at a gas station in Kennard, Texas, which was about 30 minutes east of Crockett. I go inside to buy a few snacks, energy drinks, a few cans, to give us some fuel for the rest of the night. With a nice buzz from the energy drink, we decided to get a, a little more adventurous and we ventured down FM 357 south of Kennet. We come across a few forest service roads that ventured off into rural residential roads and other country roads. I pull off on the side of the road to check MapQuest and match the cross streets that we're at and give it to my other two friends to assist with navigation. After getting back onto the road, I notice that it's 1.30 in the morning and we all joke about how we are miraculously uh, still awake. I decided to head down the next service road that we came across and this, this is where things started to get pretty weird and where parts of my memory are, well, erased I guess due to the sheer adrenaline that I had at that time. So after driving down a few more service roads and taking random turns, we get to a road that is much more narrow compared to the others. By this time, I get incredibly frustrated because it is almost 2.15 in the morning and I don't want to stumble into somebody else's front yard in a rural area in the middle of the night. So I decided to slowly proceed down the road when suddenly I noticed a, a faint light in the distance. Great, I thought. Just great. I'm about to spook some random poor soul awake. And about 30 seconds later, I can tell that these are headlights now, but they suddenly disappeared. I thought someone may have turned up ahead, but I was very wrong. 
About 10 or 15 seconds later, I see what appeared to be a brand new black Chevy Suburban. The second that I put my high beams on it, its lights turned on and three men dressed in full suits jump out and sprint down the road past my car. It was almost like they were lifeless, but they didn't even look at my car. As they were running past me, the Suburban suddenly shifts into reverse and conducts the fastest reverse maneuver that I'd ever seen. At this point, I unholster and tell my friends to grab my AR. We were all scared and I had zero clue what we were about to come up on as we drove forward. Mind you, these were the days where cell phone coverage was pretty much non-existent in many areas of this region of the state, so we had no way to call for help if something did happen. As we reached the end of the road, we came upon FM 357, the same road that we'd originated from. I still don't know how this is possible. I mean, it felt like we were just venturing further and further away from that road and we passed a US Forest Service fire station again on the way out like we had on the way in too. What I mean is that we traveled the same road twice somehow. I recently checked Google Maps for any US Forest Service fire station off of FM 357 and I cannot find any current or past historical data on it. The county tax assessor doesn't have any listings either. In any case, we got back on FM 357 and we decided to book it to downtown Crockett as we didn't feel comfortable with sleeping in a campsite after what had just happened. And I have since made sure to never venture down unknown roads without referencing GPS or maps at the very least. I am still processing that short but very weird and unsettling event. Where did those men come from? Why were they in suits in the middle of the forest? Where did the black suburban go that vanished into the night? Me and my friends still occasionally talk about this incident and no one can seem to come up with a, a sound explanation. The thing that bothers me the most though is I cannot find any evidence of this road that we were on. Google Earth software doesn't even have a road or satellite imagery that lines up with what happened. Nor does it have evidence of a fire station or any structure for that matter. So, I don't know if we just went down the wrong road or if something really weird happened that night. So an old friend hit me up a little while ago and I started reminiscing and remembered this. I believe that I've encountered the black-eyed children over a decade ago in rural Appalachia. This has always low-key disturbed me. Keeping in touch to this day, we've never brought it up again either. So we were at a local state park sort of place at between 9pm and 1am. I remember that we were parked alongside the woods and some picnic tables. It was pretty desolate. We were technically trespassing, 17 female and 17 male at that time. And what we were doing there, you can probably leave to your imagination. But as our curfews were approaching and we were finishing up our time together, we experienced what I, we experienced what I can only describe as a, a very ominous feeling. He was in the driver's seat preparing to start the car and pull off. The car doesn't start though. We sort of laugh it off as it wasn't the first time and we just talked. And suddenly, to the right, passenger side where I was sitting, we see faint lights coming out of the woods. The ominous feeling intensified, obviously, and emerging from the woods, there are four or five children, younger than us, like appearing to be maybe 7 to 11 years old. And now, I'm not going to claim that they had black eyes, because truthfully, it was dark, and I don't remember as I was pretty shook up, but I didn't read about the black-eyed children lore or phenomenon until years later, which described everything else that we experienced that night. All I can say is that they were definitely not normal. They didn't belong, I guess is the best way to put it. The cabins at the park were not occupied. They weren't even getting rented out as it was autumn and winter. We were miles from the park's hotel. There were no adults either. They were absolutely just completely out of place. What were the lights? Well, I don't know, but the closest thing that I can compare them to are like glow sticks. 
as if they had opened a, a package of those novelty glow sticks that included bracelets, necklaces, or wands sort of thing, but it wasn't like they were having fun or goofing off or anything. They just stopped, stood there, and sort of ominously stared at us. He tried asking what they were doing, if they were lost or where their parents were, but there was no response. The oldest looking male child, a bit heavy set with a grey hoodie on, approached the vehicle just in front where the passenger headlight corner would be. My friend started really freaking out at this moment. He locked the doors and was like, heck no, we gotta go. Eventually, thankfully, the car starts too. But the children, they don't move, and the kid stays put in front of the car. My friend eventually yells to the kid, I'm going to run you over. The boy slowly backs away, raises his arm, and points at us as we were leaving. We didn't look back, and well, we obviously never saw them again, but it is one of the weirdest nights that I've ever had. It's been about a year since my husband and I had an encounter with this tall, mysterious creature, but I haven't been able to let it go since. It's been plaguing my dreams and keeping me from being outside at night even. So I thought that I'd share it here in hopes that anyone might have similar stories or encounters. It was the middle of winter and everything was powdered in white. Life had gotten quite slow, so... My husband and I decided to take our two small children to his parents' house to enjoy a date night together. My in-laws only live four blocks away from us on the very bottom of a mountain in Utah County, so it wasn't a far drive. It was around four in the evening when we left our kids with my in-laws and we had only planned to pick up some sushi and head back home. But by the time that we were done and back at my in-laws, it was around 5.45 in the evening. The sun was shining brightly, but was about to make its way out for the night. We gathered up the kids, put their coats on, and headed out to the car. My father-in-law and 19-year-old brother-in-law walked out with us to say goodbye to the kids. As we were buckling them into their seats, we heard this horrendous noise. It sounded like a woman crying, a child laughing, and a bird sort of cawing all at once. My father-in-law looked at me and said, Are you hearing this? My husband said, yeah, you heard that too? My brother-in-law mentioned that he could hear it too, and I just stood there, silent, trying to dissect whatever this sound was and where it was coming from. And then I heard my father-in-law say, look on the mountain. He was pointing up about 100 yards away, and I quickly grabbed the glasses from the top of my head for a better look. And there it was, something big, completely black, and it was hunched over a bush. We stared and listened to its cry in the silence. I said, I'm getting my binoculars, to my father-in-law, and he turned to run to the house. We stared and listened to its cry in silence. I'm going to go and get my binoculars, said my father-in-law, and he turned to run to the house. The unbearable sound stopped, though, and the creature slowly stood upright to look at us. Whatever it was, it was long skinny, all black, and it could have been maybe eight to nine feet tall. It had the body of a man, sort of, but disproportionately skinny and extremely long. Its arms were incredibly long, in fact. They definitely passed the knees, and it had no facial features, no nose, no eyes, just complete darkness. We collectively stood in silence, staring at each other, and at this thing, and about 15 seconds had passed, it began to quickly float up the mountain. I'm not talking float as in was so fast that you couldn't see its legs. I'm talking literally floating up the mountain, like it was levitating. My husband describes it was about 20 miles per hour in speed, but it wasn't long before, whatever it was, completely dissipated into the tip of the mountain. I will never forget that day, and... I have not seen anything like it since. In fact, I, I hope I never really see anything like it ever again. In the summer of 2012, I took a job as an expedition canoe guide on the Boundary Waters in northern Minnesota and southern Ontario. 
These are a massive wilderness area of lakes and land. I was working for the Boy Scouts and were based on Moose Lake on the US side. My job was to facilitate a fun and safe multi-day trip anywhere from 7 to 12 days out. Most of that summer was typical too, but one expedition in particular still haunts me as a result of what happened to us over the course of a, a few days. Here is the account in full. So my crew was on the younger side. There were nine of us in total, the maximum allowed in a group per our permit. There were six scouts, two adult advisors, scoutmasters, and myself. They had wanted to do a 200 miler, but didn't have the physical ability, so we had to amend the route. They were bummed out, so I decided to take them to a waterfall called Eddie Falls. It's pretty flat up there, so a waterfall is somewhat rare, but that decision would end up putting us in the path of, well, something. So we visited the falls and we camped near it. That evening, I had the boys working on a camp setup while the advisors worked on fire for the dinner. I was collecting firewood in a big tangle of down trees, brush, and bramble. I could faintly hear the falls off to my left when, out of nowhere, I hear the most unearthly scream or roar that I'd ever heard. It stopped me dead in my tracks and I was frozen. The second scream was much closer and the third even closer than that. I couldn't see anything due to the thickness of the brush, but whatever this was, it was coming directly at me. By the fourth scream, I could feel it in my chest. I got nauseous at this and involuntarily barked at it. I've never before or since heard that sound come out of my body, but the fifth scream almost physically hurt me, but it snapped me back to reality and I ran instantly back to the camp. My crew heard it too, but I had no idea what to tell them. I claimed that it might have been a boar, but there's no boar up here, and the advisors, they knew that I was lying, but didn't call my bluff. After dinner, they went to their tents, and I retired to my hammock about 50 yards from camp. As a rule, I always set my hammock up at my head height, so about six feet up. I would use a tarp over my body and head to keep the morning dew off and the morning mosquitoes at bay too. But the tarp wasn't strung up and that's important because it was just sort of loosely over me. It must have been around 3 or 4 in the morning when I was awakened by what sounded to me like a woman sobbing. Not an outright cry but a sob. At the same time I'm hearing something walking through the thick brush down past my feet. So I listen totally still and quiet as it crosses into camp. I could hear the change from the brush to the granite rock, but could still hear its heavy footfalls as it walked right through camp and straight towards me. At this point, the tarp is still over my head, so I can't see a thing and I don't know what to do. In no time though, whatever it was, it was standing right next to me. I could hear the breathing too loud and sort of congested sounding. I could smell the musk and I could feel its enormous presence only inches from my body, just standing there. And it was time to make a decision. I suddenly threw the top off of my head and as I did this, my left hand touched this thing in the chest. It was dark but I could make out briefly a very large upright figure. The hair on it was long and coarse. The muscularity of this thing though was impressive. Bodybuilder status, pectoral, is what I touched and it all happened in a second. But as soon as my hand made contact, it bolted back into the brush with immense speed for such thick debris. By the time that I got my headlamp on it, it was gone. Unfortunately, my crew had slept through it all, so I just read until the sun came up and in the end I decided not to mention it. The next day we moved on a few miles toward base camp and camped on a small island. Campsites on the US side are designated by a fire pit and a, a grumper, which is a fiberglass toilet over a deep hole really. We were just arriving and it was evening. One of the adult advisors needed to visit the grumper so he walked towards it. About two minutes later we heard him yelling and he came running back to the camp still pulling his pants up and said that he'd seen a, a gorilla run right in front of him. 
I asked if maybe it was a bear, and he said absolutely not, that he'd hunted bear for years, and it was definitely not one. It was a monkey, and it was apparently about nine feet tall. At this height estimate, I'm imagining being back in my hammock. If I touched the chest and I was about six feet off the ground, that puts the head close to about nine feet up. So, whatever this thing was, was it stalking us? Was there more than one? The boys are definitely now scared, which meant that it was time to mitigate. I suggest a night paddle, nobody's sleeping anymore anyway, so we pack up and set out around 8pm and paddled by headlamp for several miles. My plan was to get back onto Moose Lake and camp very near to base so we could be the first crew off the water the following day. Moose Lake is connected to Newfoundland Lake by a small pinch and a channel of water that's not very deep or wide. But there's dark woods on both sides. We were right in the middle of the pinch when a rock the size of a basketball came flying out of the woods on the right side and only narrowly missed the bow of the canoe that I was steering. There's no cliff there either. This thing was forcefully thrown at us from the tree line, whatever it was. At this, we paddled like absolute demons. We paddled to the center of the Moose Lake, tied all three canoes together, and we sat out there all night. With the sunrise, we paddled to base camp, and at that, we just ended our expedition. They didn't want to talk about what happened, and to be honest, I was completely fine with that. They left for Oklahoma the next day, and that was that. After they left, I went to work a shift in the canoe yard, helping crews offload. My buddy Justin got back that day from a trip in the same area that we had been in, Bear Loop, and as I was helping him put a boat on the rack, I noticed that he had a distant look, almost a thousand yard stare, if you'd catch my drift, and... I asked how his trip went, and he said that it was all good until they hit Knife Lake or Newfoundland Lake. He said that they were being messed with for two nights on Knife and then had a rock thrown at them in the Newfound Pinch. And sure enough, for a solid two weeks after that, crews kept coming back from that area with very similar stories. One night too, there was a crowd of us guides in the staff lodge swapping trail stories and these encounters came up one after another screams, rocks, sightings of apes. Then, from the back corner of the room, I hear a chuckle. It's one of the old veteran guides who'd been there for over a decade, and all he said was, it's about time somebody else seen one. I asked how long he'd known that they were there, and he said that he's been encountering them for like 10 years now. But then he said, they talked to me. This shocked me. Like, a language, I asked? No, they communicate telepathically, he said. The less you acknowledge them, the less they'll bother you, but they can read you and they like it when you're afraid. It's like a game to them, is what he said. What happened out there is still a big question in my mind. I've always been open to the idea of Sasquatch. Their existence was never a huge stretch for me, but what really sticks with me is the way that that veteran guide spoke of their intelligence and... Also, apparently, parapsychological abilities. That they can read human emotion as clear as pages in a book. That they know our species perhaps better than we even know ourselves. So my wife and I recently purchased our first home after the birth of our daughter. Everything was as you would expect the first few months to be as well. Painting, decorating, renovating, basking in our newfound slice of the American dream. You get the idea. Unusual things started happening though, several months ago. One day, as I was getting home from after work, I passed by a strange truck two or three houses down from ours. I say strange for a few reasons too. I mean, we know literally everyone in our small neighborhood, and I'd never seen this truck or person before. There's no reason for through traffic to come down our street, and the truck was also driving very slowly. Like, put it in drive but don't press on the gas slowly. As I pulled into the driveway, the truck flipped a U-turn and came back towards my house. 
Getting out of my car, the truck crawled by and the driver stared daggers at me as he passed, and then just sped off. I don't like to judge based on appearances, and I like to think that I don't scare easily, but something about this guy's eyes just gave me a really bad feeling. Now obviously, this was weird. I mentioned what happened to my wife, telling her that we should be more mindful about security. When I told her the type of truck, my wife said that that same truck drove by and the guy stared at me when I got home this afternoon. I thought that he was just being creepy and checking me out. I tried to tease her a bit, you know, to lighten the mood up. Calling her cocky for assuming any guy driving by was checking her out. I just didn't want to freak her out, but I was definitely freaked out myself. Anyway, we saw the truck a few more times over the next couple of weeks, either driving by slowly or parked down the block and facing our yard. But one day, the truck stopped driving by and we haven't seen it since. I sort of dismissed the whole thing as being just paranoid. But then, other things started happening. In the past month or so, my wife and I have been hearing tapping on the windows at the front of our house at night. It happened two or three times to each of us separately, always around 10 or 11pm, and always a soft but distinct tapping. It sounds like knocking with a single knuckle, I guess, on the metal part of the screen door. The first time that my wife and I heard the tapping together was last weekend. We were in the front room playing with our daughter around maybe 9.30, just about to settle her down for bed, and our front room has a, a large, almost floor-to-ceiling window running the length of the wall next to the front door, which faces the street. We're all sitting on the floor with our backs to the window, reading our daughter a book when we heard it. Tapping. Now... Our house is older, creaks and cracks are not uncommon, but this sound was so distinctly intentional that my wife and I immediately looked at each other and bolted up out of the room. I had my wife and daughter lock themselves in a back room while I turned on all the lights, and I also did a sweep around the outside of the house. Of course, I didn't see anything and was ready to dismiss the whole thing as just paranoia over something that probably had an innocent explanation. That is... Until last night. So around 9.45, we heard our daughter making noise in the baby monitor. I waited a few minutes to see if she would settle down, but when it became clear that she wouldn't, I got up to put her back to sleep. The layout of the room is important to visualize this next part, so bear with me. So this room is on the side of our house, but the exterior wall just out a bit in a sort of L shape. And the corner of this L is made up of windows. If you're standing in the door to the room, you're directly across from these windows in one corner, and there's a rocking chair in the other corner pointed towards the front of the house. One window faces the street and the other faces our neighbor's house. A garden bed planted with small shrubs wraps around the outside of the house directly underneath as well. So I was sitting in the chair, getting my daughter to settle down again. I had a lamp on, so the room was softly lit. Once she fell asleep, I stood up to put her in her crib when... Something caught my eye. There was a, a figure standing about a foot away from the window in the bare space between the shrubs and the house and they were staring at us. Now, I didn't look long enough to see anything more than what appeared to be a man in a light grey hoodie standing a few feet away on the other side of the glass. Sprinting from the room, I brought my daughter back to my wife and I's bedroom, leaving her while telling my understandably confused wife to lock the door. After turning off all the lights inside the house and turning on all the lights outside, I began moving from room to room. I was peering at the windows into the darkness. I, I couldn't see anything out of the ordinary. Whoever it was must have taken off after seeing me notice them and make a quick exit. Obviously, I had some trouble sleeping after this. I spent hours checking security cameras and going from room to room, looking out windows into the night hoping that I would catch something, but also not hoping that I would see anything that could explain what happened. This morning, I went outside to the spot where the figure would have been standing. I thought, or hoped maybe, that there was a plant or something that I mistook for a person. When I got to the spot, I realized the figure had to be standing exactly in a bare patch of ground about maybe two feet in diameter, directly in front of that window. Part of me is still hoping that I'm just being paranoid. The mind can play tricks on you in the dark after all, seeing things that aren't really there. 
Especially when you're a sleep-deprived new parent, right? But with everything that's been happening, I just can't shake the feeling that there was actually someone out there last night watching us. I really do hope that I am wrong, though. It's taken me years to work up the courage to post this story to strangers because, well, the events that took place all those years ago left me puzzled and, frankly, disturbed. It's perhaps best if I provide some background context because it may help strengthen my story and people will hopefully believe me as well. I know that a lot of people claim to have a, a true story about strange encounters in the woods and... I don't want people to accuse me of making this all up. I swear to you that this really did happen. It's not supernatural, it took place during the daytime and the monster is very much human. So when I was about 13 or maybe 14 years old, back in 2003 to 2004, I went on a camping trip with my mother and stepfather and my four younger siblings. We were not a, a very well off family, in fact, we were pretty poor to be honest. I never went on holidays abroad and we would always just go camping, usually to the same campsite which felt like miles away but was in reality less than 10 miles from the city where we lived. We had been there a few times previously and we knew the campsite and the surrounding area fairly well. It was all in all a pretty safe and familiar place. On this occasion, everything was going as normal Truthfully, I sort of hated camping. My parents would always argue too when it came to putting up the tent. It was pretty boring being in the woods and I would normally be the one entertaining my siblings. I hated not having electricity, access to proper toilets and showers, etc. It could be quite fun looking back and I do treasure the memories that I have with my stepdad who is no longer with us. But all in all, it was just a, a rather uncomfortable experience. Usually though, we would go on long hikes or bike rides, with my stepdad using maps to charter our way to a small village, promising to get us all ice cream when we got there, which was a real treat as we never normally had it. On this camping trip, we were going to go on a 10 mile bike ride. Both my parents had their own bikes, along with my sister and I. My stepdad's bike had the small trailer where my three younger siblings, all under the age of five, were sitting. It was hard work going on these epic long bike rides, but I did enjoy being in the middle of the woods surrounded by nature. This was one of the things that I actually liked. And I mean, we weren't in the middle of nowhere by any means, but it was pretty remote. Remote enough for it to be inaccessible to public transport. Only forest ranger type vehicles could access the roads. They weren't real roads paved with tarmac, more like dirt roads which were really only suited for bicycles. During all the times that we went camping, we never saw any other vehicles go down these roads too. On this day though, we were all cycling down this road when suddenly we hear the sounds of a vehicle coming up slowly behind us. My stepdad is in front of us when he stops and tells us to move aside to let the vehicle come past. But there's a sense of urgency and confusion in his tone as he's unsure and why there's even a vehicle there. The vehicle passes us and we're expecting to see a forest ranger vehicle. You know, like a 4x4 pickup or a Land Rover type of vehicle, but instead, we see an East State station wagon type of car with a long body and a large trunk with a window at the back. In the back of the station wagon, I also see several large trash bags, and it was a very strange sight. I may only be a teenager, but this is a sight that sets off alarm bells for several reasons, and I knew it at the time too. Like, first of all, this is not a car that is designed to go off roads in the woods like this. Second, as previously mentioned, we've never encountered any vehicles down this bike road before, like ever. Thirdly, the person driving is clearly not lost as they didn't stop to ask for directions. Fourth, there are big black trash bags in the back of the car that look very suspicious. What I mean by this point is that they're full and tied up very tightly. We could all see into the back of the car and I didn't see anything poking out of the bag to indicate that it was full of garbage or anything. And fifthly, the driver looked very rough and I don't mean to sound rude, but he looked really mean. 
I can't recall his features, just that he didn't look like a friendly person that belonged to the countryside. He wore dark clothing and I think he was clean shaven and had very short hair. I wish that I remembered more about exactly what this man looked like. As if this incident couldn't get any stranger though, what took place next has left such an impression on me that I still recall the sense of fear that I felt at the time as I share this. Uh, the car drives on several more feet, then the driver stops. For what feels like the longest time in my entire life, nothing happens. We're all just sort of watching this car dumbfounded. My stepdad has told us to remain still. He's really serious all of a sudden too, as he's assessing the situation. Then, the car's reverse light comes on and the car starts reversing up to us. My stepdad, who was in the army for several years and was one of the toughest guys that I knew, goes into full-on panic mode. He tells us to run. We don't even get on our bicycles to ride. Instead, we all flee on foot, running with our bicycles through the woods until we find a railway bridge which we had previously passed over. We never looked back and I have no idea if the man in the car got out to go after us or anything. I don't know if he just continued driving. I have no idea who he was or what was in those bags. But why he reversed that day was strange. We never really spoke about what happened after that. I know it was something that seriously scared my stepdad because of his response. And it's left me frightened about who I might encounter in the woods until this very day. So I live in Virginia in a pretty rural area. My house is a townhome in a neighborhood right next to a middle school. I've lived in this house for over 10 years now and frequently went on walks during the daytime all around the neighborhood itself, plus the surrounding buildings and the woods. But I've never gone on a walk at night here. After starting college, I got very accustomed to taking walks around my campus at night when the weather was nice. So now that I'm home for winter break and Virginia is in one of its uh, weirdly warm winter weeks, I decided that I may as well go on a walk at night here, since it's a safe area and night walks are almost daily routines for me now. So I leave my home at around midnight, not pretty late. I walk over to the middle school and I sit down on the track. The track is a concrete oval going around the soccer field. I'm just sitting there relaxing, listening to music with one earbud in. I also had a, a lit candle on the ground in front of me, which sounds kind of weird of me to have now that I mention it, I know, but lighting candles while I sit and chill somewhere outside is just a, a habit I developed from having a ton of candles and being unable to light them in my room at college. Anyway... It was around this point that I hear what sounded like a cough, so I instantly stop my music and start looking around. I don't see anything, but I'm an extremely paranoid person, so I'm still very on edge, even though everything seems fine. I just sit there doing nothing for maybe one or two minutes, and I start settling back down, thinking that maybe the cough was just leaves in the nearby woods between my neighborhood and this soccer field. So, I'm almost fully relaxed, but... Then I heard the cough again. Then I see something sprint on its back legs across the field faster than I've ever seen anything move before. And it gets to the other end of the field and then continues to stand there on its hind legs. I couldn't see it super well because it was dark and far away. Since I just heard coughing and it was running on two legs, I initially thought that it must have been a person, but when it was standing still, I could see that it was too large and weirdly proportioned to be a human. It was also screeching the whole time, sort of, like an incredibly loud horror movie creature screeching that made my ears ring. It looked like its back was to me, so I took the opportunity to pack up and sprint home at that, not wanting to hear the sound anymore, and obviously I was pretty freaked out. I'm also physically disabled, and I can move around just fine, but never very quickly. I literally cannot think of another time in my life where I have ever run that fast, though. Now, the only sort of paranormal thing that I believe in is plain old ghosts, so as soon as I got home, I texted all of my friends about it and googled all that I could. Everyone that I texted reassured me that it was probably just an injured or diseased animal, since that can make deer act weird like that. So, that was a little bit reassuring, but... 
At the time, I'm googling about deer running on their hind legs and screeching their heads off. And while it's a decently documented occurrence, none of the pictures and the videos on any websites are anywhere near what I saw. In fact, the only accounts of experiences just like mine are posts and on other subreddits, and they were about skinwalkers and stuff. Also, two additional details that I should add are that, one, I'm just assuming that it was a deer based on its size. It didn't have antlers or anything. I couldn't really tell what it was, and I'm mainly going with deer because I'm very skeptical about paranormal topics, and I don't want to assume that it was anything other than a deer. And two, I've read descriptions of deer running on their hind legs, and I've watched videos of it, in fact. But none of the videos that I've seen really match up with just how strangely fast this thing was moving. Like, it was basically a blur running past me. Anyway, to this day I still don't know what it was, but I just wanted to get this out there. Maybe someone knows Appalachian animals better than I do and can reassure me that it was just a sick deer or something. In any case, I hope all of you guys had a happy new year and are all doing well. So I'm not really sure if this would be considered a, a paranormal story per se, but nothing else really makes sense. Let me explain. My family would go camping every chance that we got, and the place that we'd always go had no natural predators, at least nothing bigger than a fox. My dad specifically chose this spot so us kids, me and my two siblings, could sort of frolic through the woods without having to worry too much. This particular trip was during the May long weekend. There was still a considerable amount of snow, so my dad brought our ATVs and some sleds for us. It was the day after we had arrived, and my dad wanted to go on a little trip down the road that we came up. I asked if I could come, and he said sure. We both hopped on his quad, and we set out on our little trip. Oh, uh, I forgot to mention too earlier that we had deer around this area. Nothing crazy, but the odd one would wander through our campsite every now and then. You could tell that they had no natural predators though, for sure, since they didn't run away when there was a human around even. And my siblings and I would always manage to get pretty close to one, before my parents yelled at us to stay away from them. Anyway, my dad and I were a few miles away from the campsite when we rounded a corner and came across one of the most gruesome sights that I've ever seen in my entire life. On the side of the road were the pieces of a deer, at least I think it was one. There was blood absolutely everywhere. Worse still, there was steam coming from the remains, which meant that this was a recent kill. My dad is usually a pretty calm guy, not much can really rattle him, but I could tell that this freaked him out a lot. He was in the process of turning us around when this, I don't know, screech came from the forest? It was so loud that we both flinched and I remember searching the forest for the source, but my dad was in the process of hauling butt down the way that we came. It could have been a trick of the light or because I was freaked out and maybe I was seeing things but I could have sworn that I saw something running alongside of us but only for a second or two. I know that I sound absolutely crazy but the thing genuinely looked like an absolutely enormous dog before it vanished into the trees. My dad traced back to the camp and we were all packed up and headed to a different location by the end of that day. We never did go back to that campsite after this encounter too. I did ask my dad about it a couple of years ago, and he just said that it was because the new campsite was better than the old one, better trails and whatnot. But honestly, I think he was full of it. I think whatever we encountered that day scared the absolute heck out of him, and I think that whatever I saw, he must have as well. But I for one, am actually thankful that we never went back. I'm not sure if I would be able to sleep at night, to be honest, after what I saw there. And it still plagues my memories to this day. So I sleep in the basement of a, a one-story house out in the country. I've never seen or heard anything unexplainable. 
until, out of nowhere, weird noises could be heard outside of our house one night. About three years ago, the first noises were heard by both me and my mum. We had let the dog out around 12 at night and were letting him back in and talking when we heard a sound that no animal could make. It sounded like a, a large cat that had its throat slit. It was like a, a gargling meow and we both immediately stopped talking and looking outside to see if there was anything just outside because that's where it sounded like it was coming from, just beyond where our house's lights could reach but we couldn't see anything. It was like something just letting you know that it's there, then not doing anything or making another sound. The next incident happened a couple of months after when I was sleeping outside my room since I didn't have a bed at the time and the futon couldn't fit through my doorway. It was late at night, I was watching TV and I heard what sounded like someone moving stuff around just outside of my laundry room. The layout of my basement is pretty open, so from where I was laying, I could see almost everything in the basement, except the laundry room and another open area at the bottom of the stairs. So, I honestly thought that someone might have come down to get something from the fridge or the freezer, so I just went back to watching TV. But a couple of seconds later, I heard someone walking around barefoot, and since the floor is concrete, you can hear it pretty clearly... So I sat up and thought that somebody was going to turn the corner, but then the walking turned into a full-on sprint, and that was when it happened. I watched as the footsteps ran past in front of me, but nobody was there. They disappeared into our unfinished bathroom and stopped instantly, and when I say instantly, I mean no slowdown in the footsteps, just an abrupt stop. My dog used to sleep in the bathroom, but after that... He refused to even come downstairs. After that, I had my first and last sleep paralysis episode too, where I heard the same footsteps before a pitch black person on all fours crawled at me and got right in my face before disappearing under the futon. And the final incident happened probably three or four months later when I was finally back in my room. I was laying in bed when I heard those footsteps again, but... It sounded like they were running around sort of aimlessly. After a good minute of this, they stopped in front of my door and it went quiet, but only for a few seconds before my doorknob began to jiggle back and forth. I have never had that sense of dread ever in my life too, and I have never been that scared before. I ran to my door, grabbed the knob, and sat with my back against the door and my feet pushing against the wall opposite. I even looked under the door and... I confirmed that there was nothing there. I probably sat there for 30 minutes before I got the courage to move and throughout those 30 minutes I kept looking under the door and there was nothing. I slept with a steel bar that night because I was absolutely convinced that there was someone in our house. Since that night nothing major has happened but sometimes when I come back into my room and close the door I'll turn around and my door, for whatever reason, will be open again. So I don't really normally share stories often, but I've been listening to some here and it sparked an encounter that I had years ago on a solo bike tour that I thought was worth sharing. So, it was the spring after I graduated college. I'm 22 and female, and didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. So, I decided to take a pause and ride my bike down the coast from Canada to Mexico. I was pretty nervous to be going by myself, but for the majority of the time I felt safe. Halfway through or so, I got pretty comfortable with sleeping alone in fairly empty campsites and parks, etc., there were even some stretches on the trip that I rode with other bike tourists and this one encounter however brought my guard back up for the remainder for sure. So I was halfway down the Oregon coast and was a mile or so out from the campground that I had planned to stay for the night. There was this notable yellow vintage Ferrari I think it was car that had passed me headed in the opposite direction. When I pulled into the campground I stopped at the information board to look at the map and the fees. As I'm sitting there, I see the yellow car coming down the road and stops where I am. 
This older guy in his late, uh, maybe 50s or early 60s, gets out and starts looking at the board with me. He's friendly and seems completely normal, charismatic even. He's asking me about my trip and starts mentioning how he's from the area but has never checked out this campground. At this point, I'm still pretty naive. There's plenty of nice people that I've met on the trip that chat me up and ask me about the bike tour. He's talking to me and getting closer and this part is what starts to make me a bit uneasy. He would repeatedly reach out his hand to shake mine like he was about to leave, but every time he shook my hand, he would grab my forearm with his other hand and do this weird sort of gasp laugh thing. The way that he did it looked absolutely insane and the arm grass was very firm. It immediately sent shivers down my spine. But then he suddenly dives into another topic and repeats this freaky handshake maybe two more times in between. I realize then that I'm completely out of sight from anyone in the campground, have no phone service, and I'm now very close to him and his open car door. There's a knot in my stomach. I'm on the verge of tears and my voice is shaking with every response. At the time, I didn't know why, but something just felt very off about him. I finally speak up loud, hoping somebody can hear me, and tell him that I have to get going, run to my bike and speed to the campground. When I get there, I don't even try to find the hike and bike spots and just throw tent down directly across from the camp host. And thankfully, I, I didn't see him after that. Again, I had a lot of encounters with random strangers at this point, but none of them terrified me like this one did. I fought with the idea that he was probably just an overly friendly guy, but the fact that he would repeatedly grab my arm like that and laugh like that was frightening. All in all, most people that I met were sweet and it made me very trusting of others. And even if he was harmless, his actions were a good reminder that I had to be mindful of my vulnerable situation and I had to be much more alert. So something a little bit eerie, I guess you could say, happened to me one night on night shift when I was closing and doing outside trash. A chore that I have to do because I was closing. I was listening to music since there were no customers and the lot was empty. Two of my co-workers, cook and manager, were both inside doing what they had to do before leaving. I noticed a red car pulling into a stall, but not all the way. The car was parked in this strange way, kind of sort of sideways and far away from the stall where they would call in, I guess. I noticed it was an elderly couple and the husband rolls his windows down and says something. I couldn't really hear him, so I paused my music and asked if he could repeat. And it sounded like he said, are you here alone? So I laughed and said, no, I wasn't alone. They stayed there for a while before pulling out but they stopped for such an unusual amount of time in the middle of the lot that it was a bit weird. But this was when one of my co-workers walked out leaving. He's around the same age as me and we said our goodbyes. As I continued doing the trash, I noticed the car had went back to the main road in front of my workplace, but only to turn back into the lot again in a sort of slow and unusual way. I started to freak out a bit and I tried to hurry at this point. I noticed the car was gone for a while, so I thought that they left. So I was heading back to the dumpster, the big one, to throw away the trash bags when I saw it. The red car was right behind the dumpster at the stop sign. It was parked there, and this was when I quickly called my brother and I put him on speaker. I talked so loudly that anyone could hear me, and I was honestly on the verge of tears. Once I hung up though, the car had finally started to move slowly, paused for a moment again, then finally left for good. I don't know what really happened, but I just felt like I was being stalked that night. I don't know if they had good intentions or not, but I realized that my co-worker had stayed in his truck with the engine running the whole time. I can't remember exactly, but I do believe that his truck was right next to the dumpster and he may not have known what was going on, but... I'm really thankful that he didn't leave just yet because I'm kind of coming to grips with the fact that maybe, maybe this was an attempt at kidnapping or something. This was my very first job, so 
I don't know if this was common or not, or if the people just were looking out for me or something, but I don't know. What do you guys think? Is this normal, or should I have been more concerned? I haven't told anyone at work about what happened, and I'm wondering if I should. What do you guys think? So I'll need to explain some context here, so bear with me. Rock Island is a state park located at the tip of Door County, Wisconsin on Lake Michigan. It's a pretty difficult place to get to, in fact. To get to the island, you have to take a car ferry from Ellison Bay to Washington Island, drive across Washington Island to Jackson Harbor, then take a pedestrian-only ferry to Rock Island. No vehicles or bikes are allowed on Rock Island. Now, even though the island is relatively small at about 975 acres, it has had an interesting history. In the early 1600s, it was inhabited by a tribe of Native Americans as well as a small fishing village of European settlers. The two groups, they didn't trust each other and did have a few bad encounters that almost led to violence, but for the most part they lived peacefully together on the island. By the 1640s, the Native Americans had migrated to other parts of Wisconsin. Shortly after they had left the island, some settlers from the fishing village reported seeing a new group of people on the island. They seemed to be more white settlers, but they wore strange clothes and kept to themselves. No one from the fishing village was ever able to talk to one of these new settlers or even find where they were living. It was around this time too that strange things started to happen in the village. Several animals... It's not mentioned what they were, but maybe it was pigs or chickens kept by the settlers, were found slaughtered in the village and seemed to have been used to make markings in blood on some of the buildings in the village. On a different night, a building used for preserving meat burned down. The villagers felt that these things must have been done by these new people on the island and they intended to find them, but after a thorough search of the island, including the wooded inland area, they never found a, a single person. These strange occurrences seemed to stop soon after the search and none of the other settlers were ever seen again as well. In 1836, the lighthouse that was built on the northern part of the island, after construction was finished, the lighthouse was inspected and it was reported back that the material of which the lighthouse and the dwelling are made are of the best quality and that the work is done in a substantive and workmanlike manner. David E. Corbin was appointed the first keeper of the light on December 19, 1837. Only three years later in 1840, despite the apparent quality of the construction of the lighthouse, David Corbin started to complain that the plaster started to fall off the building and some sort of liquid would ooze through the cracks, leaving the house constantly damp. Corbin was completely alone most of the time at the lighthouse and some have said when visiting him that he would stare at a certain wall and sometimes spoke vaguely of the other visitors. In 1845, after eight years of relative solitude at the lighthouse, an inspector visited the lighthouse keeper and determined that, while Corbin was fulfilling his duties, he was acting strange. The official report says that the inspector ordered Corbin to take a 25-day leave of absence to find a wife to live with him at the lighthouse. However, some think that the inspector was startled by Corbin's mental state caused by years of solitude and thought that it would be best that he spend some time away from the island altogether. In 1852, Corbin reportedly fell ill and died that December in that same lighthouse. He was buried in a small cemetery just south of the lighthouse. Now, the next lighthouse keeper also reported the surprisingly quick deterioration of the lighthouse. Some friends that had visited the new keeper said that he would talk of seeing strange things in the house at night, but he wouldn't elaborate on what he had seen. In 1858, after only 22 years of service, the original lighthouse was torn down and a new one was built. From that point on, the lighthouse keepers were required to have an assistant keeper or a family with them at the lighthouse. No strange occurrences were further reported in the lighthouse logbook, outside of strong storms and occasional shipwrecks, except on January 20, 1876. The keeper at the time, named Betts, reported that he saw two men attempting to row to the mainland from Washington Island. He wrote that a, a terrible storm came up shortly after their departure, 
and they never made it to their destination. Over three months later, on May 3rd of 1876, Betts wrote that the two men were lost last January, have since been seen several times, once from Caney Lighthouse and once from Jacksonport. The men are apparently frozen stiff and sitting upright in the boat among a mass of ice. At last account, they were still adrift. There's not much hope that they'll be found and buried. By 1900, most of the island's inhabitants left for better fishing areas on Lake Michigan. In 1910, a successful business owner and inventor, Chester Thordeson, purchased all of the island except for the land that the lighthouse occupied in the north. He used the island as a private summer retreat from his business in Chicago. He is responsible for the unique and mystifying buildings and structures that are still on the island today. On the south end of the island, he built a giant stone wall that has a boathouse on the lower level. A stone water tower was built on the east side of the island, and an imposing wooden gate was constructed on the west end of the island. The great hall that was used to store Thordeson's immense book collection was there too. He had over 11,000 books, and it's rumored that he possessed some very rare books on the occult in his collection too. Thordeson died of heart failure on January 6, 1945, though some have speculated that he saw something that actually scared him to death. I couldn't find any writings from Thordeson, however, that mentioned him experiencing anything strange on the island. After his death, though, multiple churches and universities were interested in his book collection, but he had willed it to the University of Wisconsin-Madison, providing that they had to purchase it for $300,000, which they did. Some of this history is hard to find on the internet, but there are a couple of binders in the Great Hall that has a lot of this documented. Thordeson's personal papers are housed in the archive section of the State Historical Society of Wisconsin as well. Now, all of this history I gave is just to provide a little bit of context for experiences that I have had, directly or indirectly, on Rock Island. In August of 2021, I took my first and last trip to Rock Island. After taking two ferry rides, I arrived on the island at about 2pm. I had booked the remote campsite E, which is a backpacking site that is a little over a mile from the dock. I took my time hiking out to the site to enjoy the scenery and took a couple of breaks just due to how heavy my pack was. I was definitely packed more for camping than hiking to be honest, but I got to my site, set up my tent, got everything situated and started gathering sticks and driftwood from the beach so I could start a fire. On my third trip back from the beach, before I got back to my campsite, I heard a single, sort of high-pitched squeal noise coming from the forest. It didn't sound close, but it was such an unusual sound that I stopped in my tracks and waited for a good 30 seconds, waiting to see if it would happen again. It didn't, so I continued back to my site, and when I got back, I began working on getting a fire started. The remote camping sites on Rock Island are pretty well spaced out. Sites C, D and E are grouped together, but there's probably a hundred yards between each site. There's not a real trail connecting the three sites directly, but enough people have walked along the ridge between the three sites that there's an obvious path now. As I was setting some sticks up on my fire ring, something caught my eye though and I looked up. Fairly far away, it looked like it might have been at maybe site D or a little further was a person running in my direction. My first thought was, well, that's odd, because like I said, it's not even really a trail that they were on. Then my mind just went up to, well, there must be something wrong and this person needs help. They got a little closer and it looked like maybe it was a woman in loose gray clothes, maybe a hoodie. It was still far enough away that I couldn't really make out the details at this point. But I quickly stood up from the crouching position that I was in and just as I did, I heard that high-pitched squeal noise again. This time it was behind me and it was much closer. This startled me quite a bit so I turned around to look behind me. I scanned the trees for a couple of seconds but didn't see or hear anything. I turned back around because I knew the running person must be getting close now but when I did, they were gone. Again, I stood there and scanned the trees but... I didn't see them anywhere. I was honestly so confused that I was just kind of frozen for a few seconds. 
It was all very strange, but I was able to reason it out in my head that it was a, a fellow camper from site COD that was maybe running to pit the toilet that was a couple of hundred yards west of the sites or something like that. I tried to forget about it, but it really bothered me, I'm not going to lie. I really did not like whatever that squeal noise was too, and I don't know, I just felt strange all of a sudden. With some effort though, I decided to let it go and started my fire. I had a quick meal and a couple of adult beverages and then decided to take a little walk. I hadn't seen sites COD yet, so I thought that I would check those out and see if I did have some neighbors camping nearby or something. Site D was empty. I did see the path that led from that site to the main trail and pit toilet, so that made me feel a little bit less uneasy about the runner. I figured that it was maybe someone from Site C that took a strange way to get to the main trail by going through Site D or something. It didn't make a lot of sense, obviously, because I probably still should have seen them, but it made me feel better. I continued on to Site C and saw that there was a tent up. I really didn't want to bother anyone, but I just thought maybe I would go over with the excuse that I would introduce myself as a camping neighbor from Site E and see if anyone looked like they might have been the person running earlier. I came up on the site and there was a couple sitting at the picnic table. Neither of them looked like they would have been the person that I saw running, but I introduced myself nevertheless and they introduced themselves too. They were probably in their mid-30s and they were really nice too. Both of them seemed to be pretty drunk, but not quite off their face yet, I guess you could say. I didn't ask about the runner in the end or the squealing noises because I thought that that might be weird. And in the end, I just wished them a good night and I walked back to my tent. When I got back, I had a cigar and a few more drinks. It got dark and it started as a perfect night. The sky was clear and I was just staring up and looking at the millions of stars and I felt better about everything from earlier and felt a little bit stupid about the whole thing and decided in the end to just get some sleep. It was a long day and so I fell asleep almost immediately as well. At around 2.30 in the morning though, I woke up to a huge boom of thunder. It started downpouring like crazy. The wind picked up and the temperature dropped and I love camping in the rain, but I do not like camping in a lightning storm. A pretty big storm came through and I was starting to worry a bit. The wind was whipping at my tent and the ground was shaking from the thunder and the lightning and I didn't feel good about being out there in a tent and felt pretty exposed. The storm lasted for about an hour as well before it became just a sort of light and steady drizzle. I was starting to fall back to sleep too when... It was then that I heard that squeal noise again. I opened up my eyes wide in the dark and I just laid there, silent. There was another loud squeal noise and it was pretty close. Now, I knew that there were no real dangerous animals on Rock Island. There are deer and porcupines, but nothing like bear or wolves. Knowing that still didn't make me feel better though, because there was just something about that squeal that it just seemed... I don't know, weird to me. I didn't like it. I say squeal though because that's the best that I can describe it. It sounded to me a lot like a pig squeal and while I honestly don't know that much about pig noises, that's what I thought of when I heard it. An injured or perhaps angry pig squeal. In any case, I continued to lay in my tent and that's when I started to hear footsteps outside my tent. It was still raining, so the sounds were a little bit buried in the sound of the rain, but it definitely sounded like a, a somewhat large animal or human walking around. At that, I sat up in my tent and I took a knife out that I had just to feel better. In my head, I just kept saying, you know it's just an animal, it's fine. There's nothing in these woods that can hurt you. I listened as the footsteps started moving away from my tent I just sat there being still holding my knife for maybe 10 minutes without hearing anything else. I started thinking to myself, it's fine, it's just an animal, you're being stupid and you just need to get some sleep. I was just about to lay back down too when there was a very loud squeal and this time it was right outside of my tent. It felt like my heart just stopped and a shiver went down my spine. 
My heart was beating so hard my entire body was pulsing and I felt it in my ears. It took everything in me but I forced out a get out of here, not shouting but a stern and mean sounding voice as I could make at that moment. And after that, I didn't hear any more squeals or footsteps the rest of the night. But I also didn't get any sleep. I just sat there in my tent for maybe an hour before I laid down. Eventually the rain stopped and I kept laying there until the sun came up just listening. All that time I was trying to reassure myself that I was just being stupid and that it was just an animal. It was probably around 7am before I decided that I had to get out of my tent to relieve myself. And as soon as I stepped outside of my tent, I saw that my picnic table had been turned over and was now upside down. When I saw this, I surprisingly calmly thought, Oh, okay, this is enough, I'm leaving the island today. I checked my surroundings and nothing else seemed out of place. I eventually reasoned with myself that the wind must have blown the table over during the storm. It still seemed a little bit strange because the table was pretty heavy and... I felt like I would have heard the table flip over that night, but I made some cold instant coffee and had a bite to eat, started to feel a bit better about the whole thing, and then I decided to go for a hike. I admit too that I get easily scared when I'm camping by myself in the woods. Maybe that's natural, but after I had some coffee and food and the sun came out, I realized that nothing I'd heard or saw was really anything that couldn't be explained. Other than not getting a good night's sleep, I was having a pretty good time to be honest. The reason that I came to the island in the first place was to hike the 7 mile Thordeson's Loop Trail that has a lot of interesting things to see, and I was excited to start the hike today. So I packed a few things in my backpack and I started off. Now, fairly close to my side is the water tower. I have no idea how it originally worked or why it had to be a tower, but it's an impressive building with a fireplace that looked like someone had recently had a fire in it. A little further down the trail was a cemetery where two sisters and a few others are buried. It's believed that there are still more buried here in the unmarked graves too, but these likely are some of the settlers from the old fishing village. Now, the island has three cemeteries in total. There's one by the beach and that's where Chester Thordeson is buried. There's one in the eastern part of the island where the two sisters are buried. And there's one on the northern part of the island where the original lighthouse keeper, David E. Corbin, is buried too. There is also at least one Native American burial area on the island too, but no one knows exactly where that is. Anyway, I kept walking on the trail until I came to a nice scenic overlook area with a bench where I sat down and drank some water. I started to hear some talking on the trail ahead of me, but I couldn't see anyone yet. There was a bend in the trail and the trees were thick, so I sat on the bench waiting for these people to come around the bend. The voices were coming closer and I could tell that they weren't speaking English, but I couldn't place what the language it might have been was and both voices were very, very deep and sort of guttural. Then, back deep in the woods, I heard a loud and quick sort of ooh sound. Immediately, both the voices that I was listening to responded with their own oohs and... I kind of smiled because it sounded like these two heard whatever it was in the woods and they were trying to be funny and mock it by responding. I got off the bench, put my backpack on and I started walking in the direction further down the trail where the voices were coming from. But the strangest thing is that I never found those people. That was really weird too because I could have sworn that they must have been on that trail somewhere really close to me. The rest of the hike went very well though. I visited the cemetery where David E. Corbin is buried. I took a self-guided tour of the lighthouse and I passed the wooden gate that apparently used to be part of a larger structure. I walked by the great hall and dock area from where I arrived on the island. I visited some of the other structures on the island too. Came across the cemetery where Chester Thordeson is buried. Then finished the loop by returning to my campsite. It was a really nice hike with a lot to see and wasn't especially difficult, but by the end of it, I was tired. I did walk down to Campsite C to ask the couple that I spoke with the night before how they did with the storm during the night, but they had packed up and left by this time, so unfortunately I didn't get to talk to them. 
I was disappointed too because I really wanted to ask them about the squealing noises during the night as well. Anyway, the rest of the evening was pretty uneventful. I built a fire, made some meals, had a cigar, and I had some drinks. As soon as it got dark though, I was ready for bed since I had so little sleep the night before. So I got in my tent and quickly fell asleep. And I might have been asleep for about three hours when I woke up suddenly again and was immediately fully alert. Nothing that I was aware of caused me to wake up, but I don't know, I just felt like something was wrong. I sat up in my tent and this part is a little hard to explain, so bear with me. So a feeling of just complete dread washed over me all of a sudden. It was unlike anything that I'd ever felt before. It felt like there was something in the tent with me and I could feel that it was angry, seething with anger, rageful even, and I could feel its hatred for me. It felt like something very bad was about to happen and I just couldn't do anything about it. I started to shiver uncontrollably and then there was a, a smell of like garbage or rotten meat and it got stronger and stronger to the point where I almost threw up but couldn't because I was just completely frozen. I'd never felt so exposed and helpless apart from that point in my life and I stared forward at nothing, just frozen and the weird thing is is that I accepted that whatever was about to happen to me was just going to happen. It was like my brain telling me that whatever is about to happen, even if it is death, will at least be relief. And then, all of a sudden, I just blacked out. At least, I have to assume I passed out because that's all I remember until I woke up at about 10am that morning. Now, when I woke up, I was laying outside of my sleeping bag on top of it and my legs were in a really sort of unnatural and uncomfortable position. I was on my back with my left leg straight out and my right leg was bent so that my foot was up against my left knee. My heart started pounding but I kept thinking to myself that it was a dream. It must have been. But I'm leaving right now. But it was a dream. I packed up everything very quickly and I started back toward the dock to catch the first boat off the island at this point. But since the first boat from Washington Island doesn't arrive until 10.30 in the morning, I had to kill a little bit of time around the Great Hall and dock area. I wanted to get off that island though so bad, but I did feel a little better just being out of the woods, I'll admit, and that I could see other people as well. I sat down on a bench a little to the east of the dock and lit a cigar just to give me something to do while trying not to think about the night before. I was sitting a few minutes and scanning out over the water when I was startled by someone behind me saying hi. I jumped and was really embarrassed when the person came around saying, Sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. I saw you smoking and just came over to ask if you had a lighter. I felt a bit like an idiot and told him that that was fine. I just didn't sleep well last night and was kind of zoned out and I handed him my lighter. He thanked me, lit a cigar and then handed the lighter back to me. We made some small talk and then started talking about the unusual things that you might talk about. He said that he was from the Madison area. We talked about the storms that we'd been having and he seemed to be a real outdoorsy kind of guy as well and talked about his plans to move to Washington Island. It was a nice normal conversation and kind of took my mind off the night that I just had for a little bit. He seemed like a, a pretty nice guy. Then naturally he asked me what site I'd been staying at I told him that I was staying at site E the last two nights, and he said that he usually books that site, but I must have reserved it before him. He said that he had booked site D the last two nights, and I was surprised by this because no tent or anything was at site D the two times that I walked past the site. I told him this, and he said that he comes to the island a few times a year, and you have to sort of book a site, but he actually camps at a different area on the island. I asked him where he camps and he told me that most of the time he camps in the East Cemetery but he also likes to camp in the woods south of the lighthouse. He told me that he hikes about halfway down the Fernwood Trail and just heads north into the woods where he finds a place to camp. He said that one time he found the ruins of a small log house in those woods and he's going to try and find it again and camp inside of it. 
At this point, I started to change my opinion about this guy, and I wanted to change the subject, but then he asked me if I heard the screeches in the woods, and at that, I took a second to reply and knew exactly what he was talking about. I told him that I had and asked if he knew what it was. This time, he took a second to reply and I saw his face change. He looked as if he was thinking if he should tell me something, almost like a, a secret, I guess. But with no expression at all on his face, he just said, matter-of-factly, a demon lives on this island. Now, under any other circumstance, I would have laughed this off for sure, but not after what I had experienced the night before. He looked at me and must have seen the anxiety and the fear that I was feeling. He surprised me by letting out a quick laugh, and then he asked me if I had saw anything that night. I told him that I hadn't seen anything, and he stared at me like he was trying to figure something out. I felt like he could tell that I'd experienced something, and at this point, I was ready for the conversation to be over. But then he told me that he had seen something in the cemetery that night. Now, his face and mood kind of changed again, like he was trying to confide in me. I really did not want to ask the question, but I knew that he wanted me to ask it, so I asked him what he saw in the cemetery, but my voice was shaky. Then I could tell that he had changed his mind about telling me, he actually looked at me with empathy and told me that what he saw was hard to explain, but if I was afraid of the screeching noises, he didn't think that I should go near the cemetery. I didn't say anything right away, but he said four words without any context. Keepers of the flame. At that, I looked at my cigar and the ash was long. I put it out and told him that I was going to wait by the dock for the boat and he nodded and I started to walk away. After a few steps, he said, Hey, and I turned around to look at him. He just said, Don't come back here, okay? I turned around at that and started walking again. I don't know if that was a, a warning or a friendly suggestion, but whatever it was, I took it to heart. I was definitely not going to come back to Rock Island. When I did get home, though, I looked up Keepers of the Flame as it pertained to Rock Island. I found three things that he could have been referring to, in fact. The name of the Native Americans that lived on the island. It could be translated to Keepers of the Flame. The lighthouse keepers on the island were sometimes referred to as Keepers of the Flame. But then, there was also a 19th century cult that was said to visit the island from time to time that called themselves the Keepers of the Flame. I know that hundreds of people visit Rock Island every year, and... They have a great time camping, hiking the trails, and exploring Chester Thordeson's buildings, but my humble suggestion is this. Do not go to Rock Island. When I was 16 or 17, I was coming home to Brooklyn from a movie in Manhattan with my friends. I was the only one who lived in BK, so I worked home from the train alone. I was used to being out late by myself. I had midnight curfew, but I frequently broke it because I didn't think nothing bad would ever happen to me. That despite an uptick of assaults and all sorts of stuff in our neighborhood at the time too. This night, however, I was actually slated to get home on time for once. It was the summer after I graduated high school and I was feeling amazing. I had a little to drink and a little to smoke and I felt like I was on top of the world. It was really hot out too and I remember that I was wearing this long sheer cape thing and a very tight and revealing little dress underneath. Not that anything would have probably been different if I'd been wearing shorts and a t-shirt anyway. However, because of my fun little outfit, I was feeling myself and being so stupid, taking selfies while I walked down the dark streets and listening to music with both headphones in, not paying any attention to my surroundings. I think I even sang as I was walking and I got to my building after finishing my 10 minute walk from the train and walked up the steps to our apartment. We lived in a brownstone with apartments in it and ours was on the third floor. We had a gate at the bottom of the steps separating us from the sidewalk I pulled out my headphones and began to fumble with my keys at the top of the steps. 
just as I had found the correct key, still humming to myself and thinking about my great night, I heard the latch on the gate clank as if it were being opened. I turned around and I saw a man standing at the gate, staring at me. He was young, probably early 20s, wearing a grey hoodie with the hood up, covering part of his face. But I could see his eyes and immediately I knew that something was off because of just how blank yet nervous his expression was. One hand was on the handle of the gate as if he were about to open it completely, but stopped once I turned around. Somehow, my fight or flight instinct didn't kick in yet. It was probably the alcohol, I guess, but I cautiously called down, can I help you? And he didn't respond. I looked him over more closely and realized then that his other hand, the one not on the gate, was moving. Fast, low, near his waist. I registered that he was actually touching himself, gasped, and within milliseconds, he was sprinting up the stairs behind me, reaching out his hand to grab me. My brain clicked into place and I started screaming at the top of my lungs as I jammed my key into the door and slammed it behind me. I ran up the stairs to my apartment screaming for my dad, not even stopping to make sure the door was locked, thinking that if he followed me upstairs, he'd soon be met by my very tall father and our very loud dogs too, who slept in the bedroom right next to our apartment door. But as I looked over my shoulder while tearing my way up the stairs, I saw his face pressed up against the glass window, still watching me, but now his eyes looked absolutely furious. I ran into our apartment, still screaming to my parents to call the police. My dad went downstairs and looked around, but by that time, he was gone. The police came anyways after my mum called and came upstairs to take my statement so that they could make their report. The two cops who showed up asked me to describe him. I did, and they said that they would cruise around looking for him, and regardless of if he was found, a detective would call me soon to make a more detailed report. But they never actually called me. There were many more sexual assaults and other assaults as well that continued to take place in my neighborhood for the rest of the summer even. And I shudder every time that I think about what would have happened if I hadn't taken out my headphones before I began unlocking that door that day. I don't know how long he was following me for and as far as I know he was never caught either. But from that point on, for those last few weeks before I left for college, I would call my dad and make him meet me at the train station so that he could walk me home safely. Now, as an adult too, I'm far more cautious than I was as a teenager. I'm always extra aware of my surroundings, especially at night, and I don't look at my phone while I walk home either. I don't think that I'll ever get the image of his blank stare as he lunged towards me out of my head and... I'll never forget the feeling of the pit of my stomach as I realized that he followed me home, watching me and touching himself like that, and was now waiting to strike. It was like being a deer realizing that it's being stalked by a tiger, because the tiger accidentally stepped on a twig and gave itself away right before it pounced on its prey. I was extremely lucky that night.